The Committee on Oversight and Accountability will come to order. I want to welcome everyone here today. Without objection, the Chair may declare a recess at any time. All right, I'll recognize myself now for an opening statement. I want to, again, welcome to the Committee on Oversight. We want to thank Commissioner Colliff for his participation in today's oversight hearing of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. There might not be a federal agency that's more integral to Americans' day-to-day -day -day lives than the FDA. FDA is charged with regulatory oversight of the food and drug industries, industries that ensure Americans have food on the table by innovating safer and more stable crops, Industries that provide Americans new medications to treat uh, diseases. Industries that create cutting edge medical devices that can keep your heart pumping or replace a knee. These industries are vital to keep Americans safe, healthy, and happy. These industries provide millions of jobs and nearly $3 trillion in economic value. Congress must ensure the FDA is priori prioritizing safe and effectiveness, but also incentivizing innovation. Unfortunately, the FDA under President Biden is suffering from dysfunction and is failing to do bare minimum to carry out its core mission, which is to make certain our nation's food and drug products are safe and effective. Further, the FDA appears consistently unprepared for certain crises. That's why our committee has conducted several investigations into areas of concern at the FDA. These investigations have identified a pattern of issues within the FDA. At the beginning of Congress, Subcommittee Chairwoman McLean launched an investigation into the infant formula crisis. Her subcommittee revealed how the FDA attempted to hide behind the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse for neglecting facility inspections and justifying poor performance. The FDA's telework policies and lax approach to oversight left it unprepared to address the shortages when Abbott's facility in Sturgis, Michigan was shut down. Additionally, the Biden White House and the FDA took three months to act to increase production of infant formula. The result of these failures? Barren shelves, leaving millions of young families unable to access the formula needed to feed their babies. We've also investigated the FDA's failure to prepare for and adequately respond to drug shortages for essential medications used to treat infection, heart disease, and cancer, just to name a few examples. FDA and democratic policies such as the Inflation Reduction Act have dramatically diminished the profitability of manufacturing generic medications. This has resulted in fewer manufacturers and a greater risk of shortage. The FDA must improve coordination with manufacturers and federal agencies, including DEA, DOJ, and DOD to increase production. The FDA has failed to incentivize domestic manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, resulting in significant offshoring of these facilities. We conducted oversight of the FDA's failure to return to pre-pandemic levels of inspections of those manufacturing facilities for prescription drugs abroad. Inspections of foreign manufacturing facilities were 79% lower in 2022 than 2019. Last year alone, this failure resulted in two separate recalls of eye drops manufactured in India that caused an outbreak of dangerous drug-resistant bacteria killing four people. Through our investigation of tobacco products regulations, we learned the FDA is failing to consistently and effectively regulate tobacco products. According to the Reagan Udall Foundation, the FDA has been reactive and overwhelmed in its tobacco products regulation. The FDA has delayed review of applications for products that can reduce harm for many Americans. Further, the FDA's failure to regulate has allowed unsafe and illicit products to proliferate. In fact, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit slammed the FDA for sending manufacturers of flavored e-cigarette products on a wild goose chase. Meanwhile, the FDA is also failing to prevent illicit flavored tobacco products from China entering the country and harming Americans. The FDA is not implementing enforcement actions to address illicit flavored tobacco products in stores across the country. Additionally, the committee examined the FDA's refusal to regulate hemp-derived products such as CBD. Instead of using its existing authority, the FDA is requesting new authorities and money that it does not need. 
This is the FDA putting its own bureaucratic priorities over the American people who can benefit from these products. The FDA's refusal to regulate hemp products is creating a significant confusion in the market and resulting in products with intoxicants that can be dangerous to Americans who use these products. It has also halted business tying, trying in good faith to enter the market while bad actors continue to thrive. Finally, we found that the FDA ignored decades of research regarding the ineffectiveness of an over-the-counter decongestant causing Americans to waste their hard-earned money on a medication that is simply ineffective. These examples are just scratching the surface of the dysfunction and failures that are ongoing within the FDA. Today, I'm hopeful we can take a deep dive to better understand how the FDA is responding and taking action to ensure a safe food and drug supply. I now yield to Ranking Member Raskin for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, to Commissioner Dr. Califf for being with us here today. Uh, the FDA regulates everything from uh, bottled water to infant formula, meat, poultry, and egg products, prescription and non-prescription drugs, vaccines, medical devices, microwaves, personal care products, and tobacco. During the Biden-Harris administration, the FDA has made critical progress to ensure that we have access to safer food and to effective drugs. For example, last fall, FDA acted quickly to investigate reports of lead appearing in children's cinnamon applesauce packets for their school lunch. The cinnamon was adulterated uh, with lead, which was added by the manufacturer in order to increase the weight of the product to make it more profitable in the process. However, the applesauce contamination issue could have been completely prevented if end product inspections for food were required. The FDA asked Congress to amend the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act as part of the FY 2024 budget request to require that industry conduct testing of final products exactly for such contaminants and provide FDA immediate access to those results. This would greatly help to ensure the safety of all of our food products for kids and for everyone else. But the FDA needs these additional authorities to make that happen. And Mr. Chairman, I was very pleased to hear your opening comments, and I hope you would join me in supporting giving the FDA additional regulatory authority precisely to address the kinds of problems that both you and I have identified. The FDA itself has proposed multiple solutions that would address the problems we're talking about today. The Democrats support greater and more refined regulatory authority to make our food and drugs safer, and we hope our colleagues will join us. In the wake of infant formula and prescription drug shortages, FDA also advanced legislative proposals earlier this year to strengthen notification requirements and data sharing. Right now, they don't have any authority to tell drug manufacturers to produce more drugs. Uh, one proposal they've offered would require manufacturers to notify the FDA, uh, dealing with this first problem of the applesauce, would require manufacturers to notify FDA about pathogens that are discovered in certain critical foods. In the case of infant formula, this authority would help FDA prevent contaminated infant formula from reaching any more consumers and babies. A second proposal they've suggested would expand FDA's authority to gather data from industry about potential drug shortages and supply chain disruptions. FDA has improved access to contraception and protections for medication abortion access. In 2021, FDA advanced the accessibility of medication abortion by removing the in-person dispensing requirement for mifepristone and allowing it to be distributed by mail through retail pharmacies. In July 2023, FDA approved the first over-the-counter birth control pill, O-Pill. As a result, consumers' access to contraception is improved at a critical time when many states are enact enacting increasingly draconian and oppressive abortion restrictions. FDA has also made advancements to combat a range of life-threatening diseases. In March of last year, FDA approved the first OTC 
opioid overdose reversal, medication, naloxone, nasal spray, a critical step towards reducing opioid overdose deaths in our districts. FDA also recently approved new genome editing technologies to treat sickle cell anemia, a disease uh, that has uh, ravaged a lot of communities, primarily African Americans. This advancement is a crucial step towards treating sickle cell anemia and represents a breakthrough in gene therapy. FDA also secured additional supply chains in the wake of cancer drug shortages. It's crucial that FDA continue to carry out its mission and create meaningful regulations based on sound science and not conspiracy theories or ideological programs. Public attacks on FDA uh, without any corresponding legislative solutions simply undermine its ability to effectively protect public health. Uh, Anti-abortion activists brought a case against FDA over its updated guidance on mifepristone, the first of a two-pill medication uh, abortion. The activists claimed that FDA did not properly collect data on drug risks and complications. However, this claim is contrary to the FDA's review of, quote, extensive research showing that mifepristone is safe, including to take it home, unquote. FDA followed its standard procedure in reaching that conclusion and According to the FDA, it must act reasonably based on the information available rather than act based on perfect data, which seldom exists. If the objective of anti-abortion activists is to undermine FDA's authority, the consequences will be devastating to public health. An FDA that bases its decisions on political science rather than actual science is not in the best interest of consumers. Congress must ensure that FDA is empowered to rely on the facts rather than bend to the will of people pushing an ideological agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now, pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witness will please stand and raise his right hand. Do you, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, we appreciate you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Now, let me remind uh, the witness who I, I'm pretty sure you're an old pro at this by now. Uh, we've read your written statement and it will appear in full in the hearing record. Uh, please limit your oral statements to, to five minutes. As a reminder, press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it's on and that members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. When the red light comes on, your five minutes is expired. And we would ask that you please wrap up. Now, I now recognize Commissioner Califf to please begin his opening statement. Califf. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Comer, Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the committee. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity to testify about the Food and Drug Administration's work to protect and promote public health. In the United States, the safety of medical, food, and cosmetic products depends on the actions of both industri industry and the FDA. Industry bears the responsibility of creating a supply of medical, food, and cosmetic products that are safe and protect and promote public health. FDA guides and oversees industry to help ensure that Americans can have a confidence about the medical, food, and cosmetic products they are using and that they're duly warned about the risks of tobacco products. From that lens, I'd like to focus on the agency's work in four main areas today. <clears throat> First, addressing vulnerabilities in the supply chain. Second, reversing the decline in our national life expectancy. Third, accelerating effective treatment for thousands of rare genetic diseases. And fourth, undertaking the most significant reorganization in FDA history with a focus on human foods and improving oversight of all of our regulated industries. As we saw during the pandemic and continue to see, we have a significant global supply chain vulnerability, including lack of redundancy and resiliency, and over-reliance on foreign sources for critical products, particularly medicines and devices. Preventing and mitigating supply chain issues in the industries we regulate have been a primary focus. In 2023 alone, we worked with manufacturers to prevent over 230 threatened drug shortages. During the infant formula shortage, FDA's use of temporary enforcement discretion enables safe products to enter the U.S. market, which increased supply and doubled the number of firms producing infant formula for the U.S. from 2021 to 2022. FDA's continued oversight will be critical 
until supply chains are more resilient, particularly for infant formula. We'll continue to promote competition in manufacturing quality and implement modernized systems to respond to shortages faster. It's why we've requested additional authorities that would provide more visibility into the supply chain. The trends in life expectancy and chronic disease in the U.S. are concerning. And while we're leading the world in the creation of new drugs and devices, our major causes of death and disability are driven by fundamentals, tobacco use, poor nutrition, and lack of adherence to inexpensive generic medications. Given the burden of tobacco-related diseases, it's encouraging that over the past year we've seen a reduction in cigarette smoking in the U.S. and a significant decrease in overall tobacco product use among high school students, primarily driven by a decline in e-cigarette use. Despite these important wins, driven by a combination of education and enforcement actions, our work is not finished. We remain committed to reducing the health burden of tobacco product use in the U.S. Food safety and improved nutrition are essential to combat the epidemic of chronic disease and premature death. A healthier food supply coupled with improvements in key nutrition information will help consumers make informed health choices. This includes proposed actions to display simplified, at a glance, front of package nutrition information to establish voluntary sodium targets, update the definition of the term healthy in advertising, and to create a nutrition center of excellence. Thanks to Congress's investment in the Human Genome Project decades ago, many of the approximately 10,000 rare diseases, which impact at least 30 million Americans, can now be treated with new gene editing and gene therapy technologies. We're preparing to navigate a large number of these exciting therapies that will require new clinical trial methods, deep scientific reviewer expertise, and development of reliable long-term follow-up systems involving electronic health records for real-world evidence. Lastly, the agency has made significant progress in its proposed reorganization. The proposal aims to unify human foods functions into the new human foods program under the direction of the Deputy Commissioner for Human Foods and to solidify the Office of Regulatory Affairs role as a front line of FDA's field-based operations. This will enhance our outbreak response and fully realize the preventive vision of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. These proposed changes will strengthen the agency, making it more efficient, nimble, and ready for the future with the ever-changing and complex industries we regulate. In conclusion, the essential work of the agency continues in thousands of work streams that Americans in the world count on every day, thanks to the dedication and perseverance of FDA staff. We look forward to continuing to work with Congress on the agency's mission, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We'll now begin the questioning phase. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Representative Gosar from Arizona for five minutes. Thank the Chairman. Now, obviously, the FDA made a mistake in granting the emergency use authorization and license of COVID-19 vaccines. It has been confirmed that the vaccines do not stop transmission. Moreover, 1,635,048 injuries due to COVID-19 vaccines have been reported to the Health and Human Services through the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, including 37,382 deaths. Considering that under 10,300 deaths have been reported due to all other vaccines combined. The harm due to COVID-19 vaccines is absolutely staggering. And not to mention that there is no accountability. Legally, it is impossible to sue COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers for the injuries caused by their products. Just last month, a federal court forced the FDA to retract tweets and statements for its years-long smear campaign against ivermectin as an effective treatment for her COVID-19. Now let's enter Ozempic. J.P. Morgan predicts that the market of Ozempic and similar drugs will exceed $100 billion by 2030. Concerningly, there is a plethora of federal lawsuits, 18 in all so far, alleging serious side effects from this class of drugs, also known as glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, or GLP-1-RAs, gastroparesis, or, a, or simply Stomach paralysis and several in, says severe indigestion, obstruction, and vomiting have been cited in the lawsuits. One woman claimed to have lost teeth from excessive and frequent vomiting. One law firm is investigating the claims of additional 
10,000 people potentially harmed by this class of drugs. The plaintiffs predict 20,000 total people will be suing manufacturers of the GLP-1 RAs in the future. The European Medicine Agency is investigating Ozempic for suicidal ideation, according to Forbes. Also, according to Forbes, studies indicate that Ozempic and the other GLP-1 RAs, like Robelsis and Wigovi, may cause gallbladder disease. Furthermore, furthermore, a recent study linked Ozempic to thyroid cancer. Ozempic is basically a synthetic hormone that tells your brain that it is full, thereby for, therefore by deactivating digestion, as well as causing the pancreas to increase insulin levels to an or order to lower blood sugar. Many Ozempic patients face blockages and obstructions. That makes sense as the body is being fooled into stopping to that digestive pathway. Does purposely paralyzing the stomach strike you as a healing type of a remedy? It doesn't to me. It seems that the goal of Big Pharma is to get people hooked on for life on their, their products, whether it be an annual flu or COVID-19 vaccines, perpetual statins or lower to lower cholesterol, beta blockers for high blood pressure, expensive never-ending cancer treatments. Yet all this intervention doesn't seem to yield much fruit. Chronic disease is skyrocketing. 50% of American adults have a chronic disease. 40% have two or more. Are Ozempic and related drugs the next big, big things Big Pharma is going to push on millions of people, no matter what the harms or, or lack of or effectiveness? The head of the FDA, you should like to take this opportunity to express your regret, or as head of the FDA, would you like to take an opportunity to express your regret in failing to curtail the chronic disease epidemic in America? I um, would like to respond to, you, you raised so many issues and I've got a minute and 20 seconds, so I'll just start with the vaccine, which I think may be the most important one to talk about. So here's the progression as I see it. First of all, I'm pretty simple. I'm from South Carolina and I'm a cardiologist. I'm used to looking at life and death and seeing what the differences are. The question with any medical intervention, knowing that all interventions have risks and benefits, and the question is always, do the benefits outweigh the risk? I'll remind you the initial vaccine trial that led to the EUA did show a dramatic reduction in the rate of infection in the two groups. The virus then mutated, but the good news is now we have a progression of overwhelming evidence in every country including the United States. So would you, would you take a... you're on your vaccine, I, I, I understand this, but... You're less likely to be dead. You're less likely to be admitted to the intensive care unit. If you live in a county with a higher vaccine rate, the mortality rate is lower. If you live in a country with a higher vaccine rate, the mortality rate is lower. So when you compare the two, yes, vaccines have side effects. The risk of being dead is lower if you're vaccinated. Okay, so wouldn't you agree, this is my last question because I'm running out of time, don't you agree that they, the uh, uh, vaccine should have put into the, the, uh, into the fund or face liability issues? Because we, the people were used as guinea pigs. Do you believe in, in peer-reviewed science? Because there's another part that didn't get really reviewed very well. Well, I'll remind you again, we always have to do studies or clinical trials to figure out the risks and the benefits. That's a normal part in most of my career. I personally participate in clinical trials when I have the chance so that we can have the data and the knowledge to make wise decisions, for I, example, I, and get vaccinated so we're less likely to be dead. I get, I get that, but why had, did you have to retract everything you said about ivermectin? Because you came in, the, your office came out against ivermectin. Now, I agree that there's some problems in the, in the manufacturing of that dosage, but if in doubt, leave it out. Well, we didn't retract everything we had to say about ivermectin. And in fact, um, you know, you, you um, posited I hope the I hope we the had an attack uh, against ivermectin. Drugs I hope, are not... I hope the, I hope uh, the courts are object. watching this right now because so, they ordered you to. If you look at the randomized trials of ivermectin, and there are many of them now, there is no benefit of ivermectin in the treatment of COVID. That's a statement, just a fact. Um, and any drug for which there's no benefit in their risk, um, people have to make their own decisions about what to do. What we're not doing is telling doctors what they have to do. Doctors okay. have the right to prescribe okay. off-label. Yeah, you know, time's expired. Chair now recognizes yeah. ranking member for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm going to follow up uh, on this because um, this exchange to me was extremely illuminating because what we have here is the 
the commissioner who's the head of the Food and Drug Administration, and then we get a, a drive-by um, spray of propaganda, disinformation, and ideological attacks. So let me try to sort some of this out, and maybe we'll help to illuminate why we have a Food and Drug Administration rather than leaving it to politicians and state legislatures or in Congress to make decisions based on ideological whim. But let's start with ivermectin, which I believe is an animal deworming agent that some people were advocating for use to treat COVID-19. Has this been approved uh, as a form of treatment or a cure for COVID-19? No, it has not, if I may. I, I should also point out, it also has benefit for humans with worms, which is a huge problem in Asia. So it actually won a Nobel Prize because it's an amazing drug, both for animals and humans who have worms. And there was a good reason to think it may work um, in the case of COVID, and that's why, thankfully, the community, including the NIH, did a number of randomized clinical trials. There's just no benefit. And, you know, that's true of most things that we try. There's nothing wrong with thinking it might work. It just didn't. Well, what about hydroxychloroquine, which was another thing that was advocated? Basically the same story. There was really um, exciting preliminary work in the laboratory that said hydroxychloroquine may have activity against COVID, so the randomized trials were done. Unfortunately, no benefit. Again, nothing wrong with thinking it may work and trying it out in a randomized trial, but then we have the data now, so that leads you to the Conclusion. So we have not been able to grant yeah. education for those. I mean, I, I'm aware of a lot of political attacks and criticism against the FDA, but I can never figure out the coherence of it. Sometimes they seem to be saying, get out of the way and just let anybody advocate whatever they want and use whatever they want without any testing and without the various protocols you go through. And then other times they attack you because you don't have enough authority to do the things that we would want you to do in order to make kids cinnamon applesauce clean, for example. So let's, let's take that one, which has caught my eye, um, since we certainly ate a lot of cinnamon applesauce uh, in our house when our kids were, were little. Um, let's see, your FDA regulated products are manufactured or handled at something like 275 or 280,000 different registered facilities across the land. So what keeps you from inspecting every private manufacturing facility that produces things like cinnamon applesauce or peanut butter? Well, if I may, I'll try to do this very quickly. I think the best way to think about FDA in general is that we're referees. You all in Congress actually write the rule book, much like in any sport. It's the um, leadership that writes the rule book. We enact what's in the rule book. And in the case of food establishments, like most sports, the first line of defense are the players in the game, which are the, is the industry that produces the products. And by and large, they do a great job, but sometimes they don't. And as referees, we have to be really wise about where we step in because we don't have an unlimited budget. So what keeps us from inspecting all 275,000? You don't have to be a brilliant mathematician to know how many people you'd have to have but what we can do, for example, in Food for Children is to have the manufacturers be required to do the testing, which is the way the drug system works. The manufacturers of drugs have to test every batch. And in the case of cinnamon and applesauce, if there had been mandatory testing, when it got imported into the U.S. from Ecuador, the stores that were selling it probably would have picked it up at that point. And those kids ended up with lead poisoning, right? Right, lead poisoning is a very serious problem, as you know, and it causes chronic um, issues. So you advocated mandatory testing. You would like us to give you that regulatory authority. Yes. Um, and I, hope, I do hope that's something that our colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle would join us in. In the case of infant formula shortages, last Congress we passed a bipartisan bill to help address those shortages, but nearly 200 House Republicans voted against a second bill to give FDA resources to strengthen its oversight and inspection of facilities to prevent shortages like that from happening. So we can't have it both ways. If we want an effective, strong regulator, we've got to give them the authority and the resources to get the job done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Grofman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Thank you much. Uh, 
I don't know this is why you came over here, but we're going to give you another vitamin, uh, another COVID-related topic. Uh, throughout the COVID epidemic, I, I spoke multiple times on the floor with regard to the, the value of vitamin D. Now, the adequate level of vitamin D varies depending upon how you talk to, you know, 20 nanograms, 30 nanograms, 50 nanograms, but whatever the study you look at, uh, the number of lives saved if everybody had adequate levels of vitamin D is tremendous. Okay, it's a relatively cheap vitamin, um, but for whatever reason it was not pushed by the medical establishment and resulted in my opinion the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, even the most moderate studies, I'd say, would say that you were less than half as likely to die of COVID if you had adequate levels of vitamin D. And if you get up to around 50 nanograms, uh, you have a very, very small population dying. Could you comment on why the medical establishment, including yourself, oh, by the way, another thing that bothers me, if you went in for a checkup, medical checkup during that time, they wouldn't even test you for vitamin D, which isn't all that expensive because they you get blood tests for other things you're doing. Could you comment on the lack of emphasis of the benefits of vitamin D, given that the evidence appears overwhelmingly helpful and very cheap? Uh, the lack of emphasis from the public health establishment on having vitamin D. Well. It as I've already said, you know, as FDA, this is really not in our domain. The vitamin D is available on the market. We don't regulate the practice of medicine. That's um, determined by the medical profession and other agencies may have more to say about that. But I would point out one key thing about vitamin D, just a very basic in my role as a um, person who's done clinical trials all my life. There are many diseases for which if you measure vitamin D levels, the, the higher the vitamin D le level, the lower the risk of the disease. But it turns out when randomized trials have been done, where you take equal people and give some vitamin D and others placebo, for most diseases it turns out there is no difference. And that's because people with higher levels of vitamin D are different in many other ways. They tend to be healthier and spend more time in the sunshine and all sorts of other things that are different. And the randomized trials so far in COVID, to the best of my knowledge, have not been positive. But again, I want to make the point, this is not something FDA regulates. We, we, um, it's a dietary supplement, basically a vitamin. It's on the market. It's freely available in your local store, and that's between the doctor and the patient. I'd like to submit a couple of columns here, and I'll, I'll uh, yield the remainder of my time to the chairman. Right, with, with that objection, it's ordered. Uh, he yielded me time. So, uh, Commissioner, now I, I want to ask this question about tobacco. Uh, with tobacco and FDA Center for Tobacco Products, I, I think it's safe to say the current regulatory process at the at the CTP is not at all what Congress envisioned when it passed the Tobacco Control Act 15 years ago. From the Reagan Udall Foundation Report, U Commission, and recent court rulings, I, I have to conclude that those seeking to play by the rules don't even know what the rules are, uh, because FDA won't tell them or FDA won't put information out or, th or they will put information out and then change it. So now after 15 years, FDA has granted only 45 authorizations out of some 26 million applications and only five authorizations for modified risk tobacco product. And while FDA rejects applications based on science and data from manufacturers who have spent untold millions to comply with what they think the rules are, American store shelves are overflowing with products from China and your agency does not seem to be doing anything about it. So, Commissioner, given what I just described, I have to wonder, do you even want a functional regulatory process for these products, or is it the objective to target the U.S. tobacco industry, even if it means allowing a flood of Chinese products containing God knows what into this country? Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, you're from Kentucky. I am from, grew up in South Carolina, yeah. lived in North Carolina. I'm, and I was a cardiologist at a major medical center. I saw many, many people die from the ravages of tobacco. So the basics here, first of all, um, the major cause of remediable death in the United States still today is tobacco-related illness. 460,000 people will die from tobacco-related illness this year. So we're very much intent on doing the very best job we can 
starting with combustible tobacco. And the good news is, as I said in my op opening statement, we have a decline in that. What was not even present when the initial law was passed that you referred to was the presence of vaping or e-cigarettes. No one anticipated there would be 26 million plus applications of vaping products. Uh, that is a bit overwhelming, but good news here, we're 99% done, including almost completely done now with the major manufacturers. But you're, and so um, the onus that Congress did give us is what's called a public health standard. When it comes to vaping products, it's the benefit of helping adults reduce use of combustible tobacco, the major killer, outweigh the risk of teenagers and children getting addicted to nicotine, which is a brutal, fierce addiction that's almost impossible to shake once you have it. And so far, only 31 uh, products, last I counted, have produced the evidence to meet that public health standard. All the others you referred to simply didn't produce the evidence. Now, if I could say a word about enforcement, I know that was the other issue. It bothers me as much as it does you to see what's on our shelves. And, but I do want you to know that we've really picked up our enforcement. Over uh, 600 warning letters to manufacturers, uh, hundreds of civil mo money penalties now, um, and we've also now begun to do um, injunctions to, to stop. But every one of these cases is in an environment where every step we make ends up in court in complicated lawsuits that have to cause us to go back and take that into account. So it's a battle every day. We're engaged in it, and yes, we do want to regulate it. The closer we can get to zero combustible tobacco, the better. The role of vaping is still something we're working on. And we'll get back to that. My time's expired. We'll, we'll, I'll have another round of questioning with that specific, because sure. these products on the shelves that, that are getting the bad headlines are Chinese products that aren't even regulated by the FDA. FDA is regulating the American companies, but the Chinese companies are the ones that are the bad actors. That, so we'll get, well, we'll get back to my time's expired. I now recognize uh, Ms. Norton from Washington, D.C. We'll get back on that soon. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Califf, uh, across the nation and right here in the District of Columbia that I represent, uh, drug shortages are negatively affecting patients and their families. Drug shortages can lead to daily challenges for patients affecting every element of their lives as well as health outcomes. For example, because of shortages, uh, ADL, ADHD medication we have heard reports previously uh, of previously capable students barely able to pass uh, grades. Adults are forced to contact every local pharmacy to track down a medication that may be the difference between being productive and focused in the workplace on losing their livelihoods. Drug shortages have occurred for decades. And in the wake of recent shortages, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration developed new proposals to prevent and mitigate shortages. Earlier this month, HHS released a white paper with potential policy solutions to address shortages. Mr. Califf, what shortages can the FDA execute to mitigate drug shortages? Thank you so much for the question. And, um, I'll try to go quickly here because we spent so much time on this. This has been going on for decades. Um, and most of what the FDA do is to, is to can do is to mitigate impending shortages when we know one is about to happen. But the way we do that right now is we have spotty pieces of information about what's going on out there from the manufacturers. And we spend a lot of time on the phone finding manufacturer B to make up for what manufacturer A cannot do. So we have given you a comprehensive list of the information we need. Remember that most of the starting material now for our drugs is coming from China, the key petrochemicals that lead to drugs. India is a major player in the generic drug um, industry. And so the supply chains are complicated and we only have bits and pieces of information. We need more of it. But you referred to several other kinds of drug shortages, and it may be worth just quickly going through this. I don't want to take all your time, but um, I think of three kinds. The most common shortages by orders of magnitude are 
inexpensive generic drugs where, believe it or not, the price is not supporting the cost of manufacturing and distribution and quality. And uh, the, the white paper you refer to has, has a lot of detail about this in it that I would refer you to. Our um, supply chain um, pricing has hit a point where um, the price is below what keeps the manufacturers in the game. So when we do an inspection and find a problem and a supply line shuts down, that company may very well go out of business. Now that's very different than, than the shortage of Ozempic that you uh, referred to and has been discussed there. The manufacturer's making a huge amount of money with every dose. It's just that the demand is so much higher than they anticipated. That will take care of itself over time. But you also referred to Adderall, which is uh, the stimulants for ADHD, very important because these drugs are highly effective for this problem and it's bad for students that have ADHD to not be treated. Unfortunately, the very same chemicals are showing up increasingly in overdose deaths. The over 100,000 overdose deaths we have are typically a mixture of fentanyl plus something else, often a stimulant. The supply of these drugs is determined by the DEA, not by the FDA, because it's a scheduled addictive substance. So it's a much more complicated issue. The generic one is the one that um, we, we hope that we have now solutions in this white paper that have to do with fixing the economics of that industry. <clears throat> Remembering that it's not just Americans. The eight billion people in the world need a reliable source of generic drugs uh, for the world. These drugs are really important to treat the chronic diseases that were referred to. And right now, in most low-income countries, uh, we just heard from a foundation that 80% of antibiotics in one country were actually fake drugs. So we have to have an industry that produces high quality at a low cost with a supply chain which is completely um, known. And we need the data so that we can actually help intervene when there is an impending shortage like a supply line goes down or a company goes out of business. Um, so we've asked for that and I hope we can get it. My time has expired. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Califf, uh, thank you for being here today and thank you for your work on scheduling reform and your recommendation that cannabis should be moved to Schedule 3. While I and many cannabis advocates believe this does not go far enough, this is a long overdue start. So my first question today is I understand this issue now rests with the DEA. Um, and I'm cur curious if you have an update on the timing of their decision. Now, you, we're both from South Carolina. We know, we, you know, I can't, I don't even know, but if I did, I couldn't tell you anyway. So the timing of a regulatory decision is something that would be up to the DEA, not up to me. We think it'll happen this year, or you have any idea? I, I know that um, there's no reason for DEA to delay. I think they just have to take into account all the regulations that are in play. Okay, thank you. If the DEA concurs with the FDA's recommendation, um, can you help me understand if the FDA will take any, take on additional responsibilities or if your role will change as it relates to cannabis? I, this is a very complicated topic, but I'll just say that um, cannabis, you know, remember there are over 30 different forms of cannabis now, different chemicals that mm -hmm are made and it falls in this area where state regulation has been um, dominant. Um, this is an area where I believe we would be better off if we had guidance from Congress about how to proceed um, because we're not, uh, medical marijuana is one thing where there's a medical purpose and it's proven through traditional medical pathways but when it's used for recreational purposes um, there is no medical benefit in that case, it, so it doesn't fall under our typical regulation. But what's in play with this and several other things that I think we'll probably talk with the chairman about here shortly, like CBD, the question is, how do we reduce harm that's done when it's used inappropriately or at a dose which is dangerous mm -hmm. or when it's uh, packaged in a way to market it specifically to children? We're seeing. Uh, some of this stuff packaged in gummy bears that um, easily mistaken for children's <laughs> candy. But we're going to need help in a, in a regulatory pathway. Remembering that mo almost everything we do is there's a health benefit, like you create a new drug or a new device or a food for a health benefit. 
this is an area of harm reduction when it's used recreationally. Um, right. Well, and also, I mean, it reduces the, the morbidity and the addiction to opioids prescribed by doctors, too. I mean, there's a, just a, amount, a huge amount of benefit. I've seen it benefit benefited in my own life. And welcome to my world. I'm a mom of teenage kids. I've seen packaging of things. I see what kids are bringing to school, even in a state that prohibits cannabis. Kids are doing it um, all over the place. Um, and I have a bill called the States Reform Act. Um, it puts, uh, it, there's a balance between federal regulation and also regulation amongst the states, but one of the things you mentioned was about packaging. Uh, myself, and like my colleagues, were concerned about the safeguards for our youth, and one of the, the things in the States Reform Act is it addresses uh, the packaging that should not be marketed like it's candy or a candy bar or chips or whatever kind of candy is your favorite. Um, in South Carolina, I understand these product products, uh, so I'm concerned about safeguards for youths and intoxicating hemp-derived products. So in South Carolina, these products are not age-gated or appropriately tested, and many of the packages do resemble candy or snacks and uh, that sort of thing. And so it's, it, for my family, it's an ongoing conversation about what looks cool and looks like it might be uh, fun and exciting, really is not, especially on a young brain. Without revealing too much about my age, I'm a child of the 60s. <laughs> so it would be nice if in my lifetime mm -hmm. we came up with a regulatory scheme where I think America, you know, whatever your belief is about use of the product where uh, these safety issues that you've referred to are written into law so that we have a scheme whereby we can uh, regulate it. Because when it's not written into law, then we're, as I said, we're referees. You write the rules. Um, we need the right rule book in order to play uh, the referee role. I would encourage you and I would love for you to review the States Reform Act, a bill that I wrote uh, last session that that takes into account you know, the regulatory side on the federal side, but also states being in the driver's seat. But one of, again, one of the, the, the impositions in the bill is addressing uh, and ensuring that we don't market to kids. Things aren't packaged to children and that sort of thing. Um, and then I only have 20 seconds left. Um, while I firmly support the right of Americans to make choices about what to put in their body, we can all agree it is a desirable outcome for less people to smoke cigarettes and the negative health effects of which are well known. Um, any comment on alternative uh, non-nicotine products today while you're here in five seconds or less? Well, there, all right, so yeah, there are several categories. Uh, medications mm -hmm. is one category where I hope we'll see more in the pipeline. It's not robust. When it comes to chemicals that are synthesized, that also cause, activate nicotine receptors, they also cause addiction to nicotine. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got to, um, and, and the inventiveness of entrepreneurs in this area is profound right now because chemistry has gotten so much better. So there's some things I'm very concerned about in non-tobacco uh, nicotine and even compounds that are one, one component removed from nicotine, mm -hmm. which may even be more potent in terms of addiction. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Get a lady yields back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Califf, welcome. Thank you for your good work. Dr. Califf, in March of 2024, uh, the FDA issued a proposed rule regarding electrical stimulation devices that are intended to reduce or stop self-injurious or aggressive behavior in some patients. Uh, the proposed rule, if finalized, would remove VSDs, these electric stimulation devices from the market, and the devices will no longer be considered legally marketed. Uh, I've tried to read as much as I can on these. Uh, as an attorney, I try to refrain from making medical decisions on my own, especially for my constituents. Uh, I do know that the Geneva Convention regards these devices as torture, uh, but I also have a group of families in my district who are, uh, they have children and, and loved ones who are uh, undergoing these treatments and they claim uh, that those treatments help. Now, uh, as a result of this rule, these treatments will go away. And uh, my constituents have asked me to ask you and the FDA to meet with them to talk about the consequences of, of the FDA's rule. And so as, as a member of Congress, on behalf of my constituents, I'm asking you and all your staff to provide an opportunity for those families to meet with you and to discuss their concerns. 
Well, thank you for bringing this up. I know it's um, part of your duty to do so. This is a very tough issue, and I have worked in um, psychiatric wards during my career, and I think most people can't appreciate the anguish of families who have loved ones who are in a situation that might call for this or other serious mental health problems. But anyone who's been through it, I think, has a special feeling about it. Um, as I think you know, there is a proposed rule that we've now put out there. There's a docket, and we do encourage everyone to submit their comments and views to that docket. I will definitely take this back to our staff. I know that our staff has met with these families before, but this has been going on for a while, so we'll it go has. back and it reconsider. Has. It has, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, let me ask you, so shifting to something completely different, uh, last year the FDA made nearly 200 additions to its public list of AI and machine learning enabled medical devices currently marketed in the United States, and there's been some wonderful success. Uh, you know, uh, Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Center is, is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, Mass General Brigham, their cancer center as well. Wonderful, wonderful progress in, in, in diagnosing breast cancer from mammograms. Uh, clearly, there, there are enormous potential benefits here. Uh, but there's also some concern around uh, privacy and, and also uh, the lack of explainability uh, of, of some of these algorithms that are being used uh, on the diagnosis or the predictive end. Uh, what are we doing to, to, uh, to mitigate the, the negative uh, aspects of the use of AI? And I know it's coming at us hot and heavy in, 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 in so many areas, but uh, I'd like to hear what the FDA is doing about uh, guarding against, uh, you know, the dangers that might be present by this widespread adoption of AI. Thanks for the question. I'll have to contain myself here because you may know that I worked at Alphabet or Google during the five years between my two FDA stents and very heavily into this, and I think it's going to be a huge benefit, but also with a huge risk on the other side if it's not um, regulated. Also, we have many mutual friends. I'll be at Mass General next week as visiting professor and learning from the people in the Harvard system who know a lot about this stuff. Well, this is one of the topics. The thing I would emphasize is that um, I don't think it's um, explainability that's really the issue. And I think an easy way to think about this, think about yourself before you had a map in your car that you could talk to when you used to drive the car and you get in an argument about which way to go and then you'd have to pull out the map and look at it. Okay. Well now, you just talk to your car and what's going on with the car is AI continuously in real time, taking into account everything that's happening on the roads, the template of what's there and your personal preferences that it learns as you go along. And I think if AI works, we'll take it for granted because there are many things we do in medicine. If you ask me, how does aspirin work? We, have, we know a lot about aspirin, but the, exactly how it works for each disease, we're not so sure. But we know it does work for uh, particular things. So what we're really focused on is creating a community in our health systems and the industry that, like I've already said, we're referees. We depend the first line is self-regulation by the industries. And what's really important here, I think, where AI is going Generative AI, it learns as it goes. The more information it has, either the better it gets or the worse it gets, you don't know which one. And if you just put it in place and don't tend to it and monitor it, it can go wrong in really bad ways. I saw that at Alphabet. It was something we really worried about. And so we've got to reformat our health system so that as, it, as time goes on, you're constantly looking at what the algorithm is doing or its predictions accurate. That's really the key thing that we have to do. And right now, we are not configured to do that. So we're working very much with a community of health systems and uh, the industry to come up with a scheme of what's called assurance labs. And this would be, you sell your AI thing to somebody, it goes out there, there's going to be a monitoring that says it's either working or it's not in practice. And it also looks for this bias that we're all con concerned about that if you put the wrong information in, you end up with a prediction which is preferential to one type of person compared to another. That's got to be looked at. Yeah. 
So I'll, I'll stop there. I know yeah. I can Mr. go on a while on this. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your, well, thank you. Yep. Thank you for your answer. Dr. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your indulgence. I yield back. Chair, I recognize Mr. Sessions from Texas for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner, and thank you for taking time with us. Uh, as you've noted, a cardiologist also spending time in mental health stress units. I think that part of what I'm going to talk with you about would come directly to observations that you may strongly identify with. In August of last year, Assistant Secretary for Health Levine sent Drug Enforcement Administra Agency Director Ann Milligram a recommendation from the FDA to downgrade marijuana, also THC, from Schedule One to Schedule Three under the Controlled Substances Act. This recommendation made the claim that marijuana meets the criteria for control under Section Three. In reviewing the FDA's recommendation, I believe that the FDA did not base its assessment in scientific fact or realities of how marijuana is being abused and used in our country today. The FDA's assessment relied on, I think, cherry-picked data. For example, concluding in the report that since the potential for abuse of marijuana is less than heroin, marijuana should be downgraded. This completely ignores the realities of a drug that is causing enormous consequences of children and adults in our country, high schools, middle schools, and communities. Just last week, Bloomberg Editorial Board published an article emphasizing the sharp rise in marijuana THC-related traffic fatalities. One analysis, which is consistent with a Hyder report out of Colorado, a 10% increase in vehicular deaths. In California, the increase was 14%. In Oregon, 22%. Nearing 50% of the deaths on a highway, the driver had THC in their blood. And those are only the marijuana-related traffic deaths that we know about. We know that there are other problems. In your agency's analysis, you scrap the long-held five-factor test for determining a drug's medical necessity to simply two factors. Two factors that relied on the fact that marijuana, as was reported, currently is accepted for medical use because it is prescribed by healthcare practitioners through medical marijuana programs. So what I would ask you is, why did the FDA create a new, less rigorous, two-factor test to determine this when you know the reams of data and evidence suggest it's not only addictive, but it is a contributory to not only death, but long-term stress of people who use this and confirmed by uh, the medical community? Well, sir, I, I appreciate the question. I think you've already demonstrated between you and the other representative that um, there's not agreement in Congress about what should be done with this. And again, we would very much appreciate if Congress did come to a conclusion for the country. Well, it would make Congress our job has. better. Congress has not spoken because right. we believe it's a dangerous product. We receive calls from thousands of parents every year about their children. We see drug-related uh, not only instances in schools, but uh, principals, teachers, people report the real problem. And the problem gets even worse as gumbies are, are introduced into the I, system. I certainly appreciate those concerns. And let, um, so let, me, let me remind you that, a, that a, a Schedule Three does not put marijuana on the market in the United States. No, it's it does not, but you do control. know exactly what it does do. And you've what, the FDA what we need suggested that it's not a dangerous product like heroin. Well, neither were cigarettes like heroin. Well, uh, with all due respect, um, I, I think it is differentiable from heroin and I think cigarettes. It is too, cigarettes but it's a directly product. cause death. And I, I appreciate that you feel that way, and your colleague just gave exactly the opposite point no, of she, view. She talked about the the public opinion. 
not the medical opinion. You are a medical doctor, a so cardiologist, and you are here to answer, and I thought you did do a fair job to answer that you do see where when not used properly, it is a dangerous product, and it is a dangerous product, and I thank you very much, and I appreciate you being here today. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Chris Morte from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Califf, in February 2021, I was chair of this House Oversight Subcommittee's Economic and Consumer Policy Subcommittee. We studied the presence of toxic heavy metals in baby food at that time. And in March of 2021, we issued a report yeah. with regard to the presence of lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury in astonishing levels in baby food products. For example, we found that baby food had on average 177 times the permissible amount of lead in drinking water. In response to public pressure coming off that report, FDA issued an action plan called Closer to Zero. This was the first time FDA would be regulating toxic heavy metals in baby food, which is obviously a good thing. When my, when my subcommittee issued its report in March of 2021, FDA said that it would issue its initial draft guidance regarding permissible lead limits in baby food within one year, so roughly April 2022. Instead, it missed that deadline and issued its draft guidance in 2023. But let me talk to you about some of the other toxic heavy metals in baby food that are covered by uh, the Closer to Zero program. I want to throw up here a screenshot of your website from today. And specifically, I want to talk about when you say final guidance will be issued with regard to permissible limits of other toxic heavy metals. So in terms of when, for instance, arsenic in baby food would be examined and you'd be issuing final guidance on permissible levels, your website says, and this is my red circle, no update. That's what it says, right? I'll take your word for it. I can't, can't see it from this distance. Let me talk to you about cadmium levels. Again, a uh, screenshot from your website today. Uh, you say that uh, we should expect final cadmium levels at some undetermined point, and again, your website says no update. You don't disagree with that, right? I, I'm not up to date on the exact, but I'll assume that you're telling the truth here. Thank you. Mercury, a dangerous, toxic, heavy metal in baby food. Again, we go to your website, and with regard to when we should expect to hear from you with regard to permissible levels of mercury in baby food, you say no update, right? You say it, it must be so. Dr. Califf, this is unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. It's been three years since we issued that report. The public, the parents are outraged about the amount of toxic heavy metals that are present in baby food. And quite frankly, sir, I respectfully say that your closer to zero program at this point is closer to, no, closer to zero updates. And that's very, very disturbing. I want to turn my attention to another topic, which is the youth vaping epidemic. And you and I have spoken about this before as well. Your own 2023 survey indicates that 10% of middle and high schoolers are vaping today. 90% of them preferred, prefer flavored vapes. And the vast majority, sir, the vast majority of those flavored vapes are illicit vapes coming from China. Here is one of those illicit vapes right here. It's a strawberry mango EB Create vape. And it's illegal but you can buy it today because you folks have not cleared the shelves of these illicit products. On December 7th, 2023, a dozen of us wrote to you asking for a comprehensive approach to dealing with these illicit Chinese vapes. And you didn't respond to me at that time, did you? I'd have to go back and look, but I, we've had much correspondence about this issue, so I'm not sure of that particular one. I know. You're too busy to respond to us, of course. It's been five months, sir. After that, we wrote you February 1st, 2024. Again, 
same issue. We want to know how you're going to deal with these illicit vapes coming from China. You didn't respond to that one either, right? I'd have to go back and look. Sir, what bothers me about your answers is this. The reason why you didn't respond to us with your approach to clearing the shelves of these illicit vapes from China is perhaps because you don't have an answer. It's because you don't have an approach. And I mark my words, the illicit vapes coming from China, flooding our market, these kid-friendly flavors such as the ones here or the ones I hold in my hand is the next chapter in this youth vaping epidemic, and it's time you take this seriously. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Dr. Fox from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Califf, the Center for Tobacco Product, or CTP, must make timely decisions on whether products, especially tobacco harm reduction products, can be allowed for sale or not. However, stakeholder groups with pending pre-market tobacco product applications, or PMTAs, have been waiting for several years to a decision which far exceeds the 180-day review period written into law. Can you tell me in 25 words or less, why has the CTP failed to comply with the statutory review period despite the fact that the CTP's staff has more than doubled in the last decade? You said less than 25 words. It's 26 plus million applications. We're now 99% done, and soon we will be within that time frame. But you know among those applications are very frivolous applications, and there's like a couple of dozen in there that are coming from legitimate places. And you all should have focused your attention on those. It, it's hard to believe that an agency that's doubled its staff over a decade to over 1,200 receives over $700 million per year in funding is still not meeting the deadline for these PMTAs, the serious ones again. It's my understanding relatively few serious from legitimate companies. What steps are needed to bring more accountability to the CTP? I'd remind you that um, the vaping industry right now pays no user fees, so all the money and people that are hired are hired off of the combustible product industry. There we have tremendous gains. So in terms of the um, transparency now of the applications, uh, people can track it. Uh, the information is published, and you're seeing continuous improvement in our efficiency. So what are the perform what performance metrics does the CTP have to ensure they're being good stewards of the tobacco user fees? Um, it's the, the numbers of applications, the time it takes to review them, the outcomes of the reviews are um, discussed by numerous uh, watchdog groups that are looking at everything that we do. Had the CTP done done its job over the last decade, there should have been tobacco harm reduction products approved through the appropriate process. There's clearly a demand for these products that's being filled by illicit flavored disposable e-cigarettes now make up more than 70% of the e-cigarettes or ends market, as my colleague is talking about, most of which are from China. What is the FDA doing to rectify this problem of illicit products in the market? Um, if I may, tobacco harm reduction product is an industry term. I'd say we're all in favor of reducing harm from tobacco. Um, and as I went over uh, with an earlier question, we have an increasing number of uh, uh, warning letters, civil money penalties, and injunctions now, and seizures now at ports of uh, places of import. It is a very large number of products. There's no question about it. It is a big job, and we have a lot more work to do. Commissioner, you've recognized the critical need for the public to have access to accurate medical and scientific information to help inform the decisions they make about their health. 
how does the FDA justify the decision to spend millions on ad campaigns and scare tactics such as brain worms or metal dragons that are not based on verifiable facts? And when will the FDA focus on the facts about what can make cigarettes deadly as Congress intended in the Tobacco Control Act instead of relying on misunderstandings and outdated narratives? I'm not sure I follow that question. I would just say we've seen dramatic progress in reduction in combustible pack, uh, tobacco use, significant reduction in the number of people dying, although it's still 460,000. <clears> I'll just note that in my time at um, Alphabet, I learned a lot about advertising. Um, I think our statements are based, in fact, and they include a component to reach into the culture of people that need to receive the information. Simply stating a fact when you're talking to a teenager is not necessarily the best way to reach that teenager. You need to have the mind prepared to absorb the information. So brain worms and metal dragons. Um, I don't know about brain worms and metal dragons, but I'll take your word that something alluding to that must exist somewhere in there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Kana from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Kellef, thank you for your service. So many Americans are frustrated that even with insurance, they're having to pay thousands of dollars for drugs for cancer, for multiple sclerosis, uh, for getting inhalers, hundreds of dollars. I want you to help explain to the American people why this is happening, and to start by giving two sentences on what the FDA's orange book is. Well, the Orange Book is a, is a listing of patents that are relevant, relevant to um, drugs that are marketed. Correct. And if, if something is listed on the Orange Book, is it correct that for 30 days, uh, for 30 months, a generic manufacturer can't produce that? That's a, uh, with some caveats, but essentially that's a, a fair statement. So let's take a couple examples. You have a multiple sclerosis drug. Copaxon, produced by Teva. It costs patients between $3,000 and $50,000, and it is currently listed uh, on this uh, orange book. Now, Teva, the company producing it, is going to come again to have it listed with no real changes to the drug, cosmetic changes. If they list it again, then no generic manufactured drugs can be produced, correct, for 30 months? It's a little more complicated than that. I mean, you, you left out one step before that, which is that you have to have a patent, which says it's a significant sure. new thing. But uh, our, our role in the Orange Book is ministerial. That is, we list the but, but you have discretion of whether to list it or not, correct? Not much discretion. But no. technically, you have that discretion. Not really. We have to list them. And what, what would happen if you didn't list them? We'd get sued. But what is happening is you have these companies that are getting you to list this and not have generic competition. And so then, as a result of it, the American people are paying $50,000 for drugs on multiple sclerosis, or in the case of Revlimid for leukemia, they're paying $17,000 because you're listing something in the FDA that isn't allowing generic competition. Now, you can say the blame is with the patent office, but if those were not listed at the FDA, you'd have generic alternatives. Is that not correct? You know, uh, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. We are all sinners, so we'll take our share of uh, blame here. We are, it's, it's a point of emphasis between us uh, and the patent office now to try to get rid of frivolous patents, which is what you're referring to. Frivolous patents just to extend the time period in which a company... But would you say that problem. in the case of uh, Copaxon, where Teva is asking for more patents and multiple sclerosis patients are paying 3000 to 50000 that that could be frivolous, or with Revlimid, which is where they have 27 patents to treat leukemia, that, that there could be some of those being frivolous? As FDA commissioner, I, that, that, that decision really is an FTC decision. I have personal opinions about parts of this. What's your personal opinion on those it, two? There, there are too many um, efforts made to extend patents, but I won't comment for, for on the specific one. But what about I, for, for AstraZeneca and, then, and, and the inhalers well, with Simbicort? I, I can't 
refer to a specific one, I will note that my mom got some extra life expectancy due to Revlimid, so, and I'm very familiar with what happened with the cost. And so what, my question, I guess, is what can we do in Congress? Because this is what's frustrating people, and I'm not blaming you, sir, but I, I'm saying that you've got a system where you're listing these drugs. Maybe you're saying your hands are tied. It's not bringing those costs down, uh, and we keep getting, from the American people's perspective, how do we solve this? And if you could give me 10 seconds, I have one more question, but you have a 10-second uh, recommendation. Maybe the analogy's worn out. Again, we're the referees, so it may be something where our staff will need to get together with yours and the Patent Office and see if there's anything that can be done well, to tighten to up the laws here. And the, second, the, the last question I want to ask, and it's, it's not a, a gotcha or anything, because I know when you were in the FDA, then afterwards, you got consulting fees from Merck, AstraZeneca, Biogen. I take you at your word that there were ethics reviews, and then you said that there were no ethical conflicts. But one of the things I proposed is members of Congress should not become lobbyists. Would you commit today that after your service as FDA chair, you will not take any money as consulting fees from Big Pharma going forward? I, will, I, I have a, a, a written record on this for two years. Beyond that point, you know, we'll have to see. I'll be well, Why not just make that commitment so that the American people have confidence that you won't take, you can make plenty of money at Google or somewhere else. Why not I, just say, I'm, a, I'm not going to take big pharma money? I'm not looking to make money. I'm looking to contribute to the development of effective. And why not say you won't take it after regulating it? Um, just make I, that commitment I, today. I certainly um, have made the commitment for a period of time, but I can't speak for the rest of my life. I think you should. I appreciate your opinion. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair, recognize Mr. Fallon from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we have some bipartisan agreement, Representative Connor. I would love to, uh, to co-author any bills you have for uh, preventing members of Congress from becoming lobbyists. I think it's good government. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm here today, Commissioner, not so much as a member of Congress, but as a parent. And I just wanted to visit with you on a few things, uh, particularly you know, I have two teenage boys, 17 and 14, and I see the teenage vaping, you know, skyrocketing. And I think that's entry to uh, some, some really nefarious habits moving forward. And I'm particularly concerned about the use of illegal and unregulated Chinese vapes that was touched on before. And the FDA's role in contributing uh, to this, I think, you know, proliferation that we see across the country. So the Tobacco Control Act of 2009 created pre-market review process allowing for new tobacco products to enter the market. Yet, as myself and nearly 60 of my colleagues pointed out in a letter we sent to the President last month, a letter uh, led by my good friend, Congressman uh, Rich, uh, Richard Hudson, despite the FDA's receiving over 26 million smoke-free applications since this law, the FDA has authorized fewer than 50 product uh, applications, with less than 10 being commercially available. During this time, however, they have authorized thousands of combustible cigarette product applications. But as January of 2024, there were only 23 authorized e-cigarette products in all by three manufacturers. The FDA's inability to produce, or to process rather, the PMTAs in a timely manner has resulted in a proliferation of illegal Chinese vapes flooding the market all over the country to meet the consumer demand, often in flavors that I th I'm sure you do ho hopefully agree are horrific in so much as they appeal to kids. Peach Mango Watermelon, which is a, a flavor currently offered by EB Create, a wildly popular brand formerly known as Elf Bar. This is a Chinese company whose vapes are illegally here, yet easily purchased at local stores. In fact, a uh, local shop, smoke shop over in Virginia, this picture was taken two days ago, and you can see the, in the yellow up there, those are all displayed. They're illegal Chinese vapes uh, along the wall. And we're not speaking about hypotheticals or back alley deals. This is flagrant noncompliance. And this was just randomly uh, discovered. By the inaction of the FDA, what we essentially see is um, a, almost a prohibition on legal products with unregulated and illegal products rushing in to meet the demand. Then. Uh, by further weak action on enforcement, U.S. stores have seemingly no concerns about openly selling the products all over the place. So, Commissioner, uh, by law, how long does the FDA have to review PMTAs and take action on them? 
believe it's 180 days is uh, legal. And how, and uh, you're correct, and how long on average is it actually taking? Um, it's hard to calculate an actual number. There are 26 point something million applications, so, and some still outstanding. So, um, you know, we're obviously not meeting the 180 day timeline, although it's um, getting better as we're plowing through and 99% complete, which still leaves hundreds of thousands to go. Do you think, I mean, the industry stakeholders have told us that uh, they're claiming it's three years. Is that feasible? Um, you know, remember the history, and uh, when I was commissioner in 2016, it was right when vaping was starting, and it went immediately to millions of products. There were some laws in between, and it's the case that there was such a flood of products. It could be if you went back, you know, three or four years ago, you'd say, okay, three years until now. But if you look at applications coming in now, it's much shorter than that. Because the FDA's website shows that the approved PMTs for 2023 took roughly two and a half to three years for each one. There was a there was a bolus effect that had to be dealt with, um, as uh, one of your representatives already pointed out. Millions were taken care of by um, getting rid of the ones that didn't have useful data in them. I, I think that it would be it would behoove you all to have a regulatory framework in place, and warning letters uh, are, are one thing. How many seizures have we had at retail shops across the country? We've only had a few seizures. We've had uh, 32,100 civil money penalties, and those are ramping up considerably um, as we go. As I think you know, seizures require a whole different order of magnitude of legal work, both before um, So and we now. only have a few seconds left. So what, how do we, these are all over the place. So what do you think that the FDA can do to, um, you know, mitigate this? Well, given the fact that there's a vape shop in almost every um, neighborhood, it would take a lot more people to do what you're saying of clearing the shelves. So uh, we have an action plan. It's going to uh, get better and better. Um, as I've already said, if user fees were paid by the vaping industry, uh, that would be about $100 million. We could hire a lot of people and spend a lot more time out there in the shops. And I'm not trying to suggest that every illegal Chinese vape is going to be taken from the shelves, but you know as well as I that when you have, you can set examples and make examples, and the word gets out that if you have these products, you're going to heavily find, and they're going to seize them as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Mfume from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Raskin for convening this hearing. Um, and before I go into my observations, Dr. Califf, let me go back to something that the ranking member said earlier that I don't want to get lost in all of this, and that is that maybe what we ought to be doing in addition to this is trying to find a way to create more regulatory pathways, giving the FDA the ability to do many of the things that you said you could not do here today. Um, Dr. Califf, I'm deeply concerned about the over-prescribing of ADH medications, particularly Ritalin and uh, uh, Concerta, as it relates to kids in poor neighborhoods as a means of dealing with their, quote, hyperactivity in school, and that so many studies have shown that whether they're poor black, poor white, poor Latino, this over-prescription seems to take place and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just don't think Humpty Dumpty fell. I think he was pushed. And so moving under that premise, I think that unless we do have greater regulation, uh, regulations over the overprescribing of these medications, it will continue. Now, let me just flip that around to the other side. I'm also deeply concerned about children who are unable to focus on things and are given these medications and where all the protocols have been followed. Uh, and I'm concerned about that because in many instances, those drugs, unfortunately, uh, have been part of the shortages. I'm concerned about cancer patients who are forced to delay treatment, as you know, because many of the required medications are out of stock. And so those are just a couple of things that I'm hearing from my constituents in Baltimore on a regular basis. I know that supply chains were disrupted during COVID uh, and that there have been intermittent and sometimes not intermittent drug shortages occurring 
throughout the U.S., but I would be less than honest if I didn't just tell you from my perch some of the things that, that I hear. And I recognize you don't carry a magic wand in your back pocket. The only thing you can do is to help guide us, listen to us, and suggest to us ways that we can help you. Um, the FDA serves as an important regulator, to say the least, and it is well positioned to assess potential supply chain disruptions. Can you tell us, and this committee, and the people around the country who may be watching these uh, proceedings, how is FDA working now, currently, with manufacturers to mitigate the ongoing drug shortages, and have those manufacturers, in your opinion, been transparent with the FDA about potential shortages and the real root causes of those shortages? Thank you for that. Uh, first of all, just a comment you made about the underprescribing and the overprescribing. I, th I think it exemplifies a major problem that we have in the intersection of the responsibilities of the FDA and um, the practice of medicine. Uh, there is no doubt that people that need uh, these drugs are not getting them, and people that don't need them are getting them. And that equilibrium, of course, is not set by the FDA. I'm also a physician. It's a clinical. Um, quality issue that we need to work on, and we're trying to help as best we can with that. But your main question about the manufacturers, we work every day with the manufacturers. They're required to give us certain information, but frankly, they've resisted us giving us some of the crucial information that we really need. When there is an impending shortage, we're finding that they're very cooperative to work together to try to fix it, but it'd be better if we had all the data we needed to put together predictive algorithms that would allow us to intervene preemptively much, much earlier and prevent the shortage. So we have a list that um, you all have a copy of that lists the areas where uh, the correct information would make a difference. But I also want to point out that while there's a shortage of uh, the stimulants for ADHD, the biggest shortages are occurring in inexpensive generic drugs where the less expensive the drug, the more likelihood of shortage because of the way the market is not succeeding in rewarding high quality manufacturing. And that's a point I think we really need to address over the next few years. And, and any guess on your part as to what factors affect non-generic drug shortages? For non-generic drug shortages, there are really only two major t uh, types because if not a generic drug, as we've already discussed, in general, the manufacturer is making a handsome profit once the product is on the market. That's my point. So they're pretty good at figuring out how to make it. Yeah. The exception, as I said, is Ozempic or, or the weight loss drugs where the demand is just so high they haven't been able to keep up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Biggs from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Kelly, for being here today. The University of Arizona has been engaged in research that would advance pain and addiction research to help combat the opioid crisis. They're looking for ways to expedite known drug candidates through the phase two and phase three trials to take non-addictive pain relief medications to the market. U of A has informed me that they have found if they can repurpose clinically available medications that are, have proven to be non-addictive and have also shown to be effective for treating different types of chronic pain, they think they, they're ready to go forward in, in these trials. But they also report that there's a need to repurpose some of the medications specific to sex differences because pain is differentiated based on sex and that would have an impact uh, on what, how, how they develop this drug. So the question is, during the COVID, era, uh, FDA, FDA was able to expedite clinical trials, yet U of A tells me that they're struggling to obtain approval for phase two and phase three clinical trials on something that could be, could alleviate chronic pain and help reduce uh, the risk of opioid addiction that we see so rampant in the society today. So I guess my question is, could this be a statutory problem, a regulatory problem, a, a resource problem? What, what, what might we be looking at? And I, I realize I'm giving you a very specific uh, example, but um, hoping that you can give us some information. Well, um, you know, the way um, it works at FDA and the 
drug side is their user fees that are paid, and we have statutory or agreed upon, passed by Congress every five years with the user fees. Timelines, we're meeting those timelines, which are agreed to between the industry, the FDA, and then put into law by um, your uh, passing the law. I'm not aware of the particular circumstance you're giving. There is a thing um, that we say at FDA, and God we trust, all others must bring data. So I'd have to know the specific data sure. coming from University of Arizona to know if there may be some issue that's causing a back and forth that wouldn't fall within the usual timeline. But when that happens, it's very much noted um, that that's the case. So well, we, we would love to, the opportunity to present you with additional information, whatever we need to, sure. to find out what may be the hitch in the get along. That would be good. With that, I'll yield to the chairman. Thank you for yielding. Uh, Commissioner, it's FDA's responsibility to ensure that the safety and efficacy of all drugs marketed and sold in the United States, regardless of where the drugs are manufactured. Yet the number of inspections conducted annually has been declining since 2013. At the same time, Chinese and Indian manufacturers have received the most FDA warning letters by far. These violations include contaminated medicines, non-sterile manufacturing, and falsified data. So how is the FDA working to keep foreign manufacturers accountable? really appreciate that question. As I've already um, established, um, we are doing a major reorganization because um, I agree with you that we need to pick up the pace of the inspections that we're doing. But again, as I've already said, the first line of defense of the manufacturers themselves. And so here's where modernization of our data systems is important. Because the more we can keep up with what's going on, not just in U.S. facilities, but all around the world, the better we're able to target our inspections and to have the frequency that's needed to keep the manufacturer in shape. One of the big areas that we're working on now is India, where we've completely redone our inspectional system. And I've personally gone to India to meet with the Indian government um, to work on the relationship so that the inspections can proceed um, and I believe they are acting in good faith in India right now as one example. So think of it as a layer of data and information that should be constantly coming in now that all manufacturing is digitized. And then the human side where the inspector actually shows up, the investigator, in the facility, those are being increased and it's been a major point of emphasis in our um, reorganization. So there aren't a lot of bipartisan agreement on controversial issues in, in this Congress, but w one thing I think there's overwhelming bipartisan agreement on is the fact that we need to have more domestic manufacturing of our pharmaceuticals. What, what can, in your medical opinion, as Commissioner of FDA, what can we do in Congress to encourage an environment where all of our essential, or, or, is, or much more at the very least, of our essential pharmaceutical uh, production is manufactured in the United States? Well, as one of your colleagues um, pointed out uh, through the Socratic method of asking the question, I don't think it's a big issue for um, innovator drugs because that industry doesn't experience much in the way of shortage. But for this generic area, it's an area where we do need to reshore significantly. But it's a national security issue as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Right. And when the raw material is coming from China, um, it's an issue that we need to take seriously. So, as you know, FDA doesn't deal with the prices and uh, the market per se. I would refer you to the HHS white paper that just came out with a large input from us. And basically, we need to create an economic market situation where the price is fair so that the manufacturer can produce the product but also invest in the technology of manufacturing and can be done using American labor, which is more expensive than labor in other countries. I'd also say, I'm not talking about 100% reshoring. I don't think we need that, but we need enough of a footprint in the U.S. and in uh, nearby countries that we're assured that if something goes wrong anywhere in the world, uh, we keep this up. 95% of our prescriptions are now generic. Mm -hmm. And we'll touch on that later by time's expired. I chair, I recognize Ms. Bush from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. St. Louis and I are here today, Dr. Califf, to first thank you um, for the work that the FDA has done to eliminate cumbersome restrictions on mifepristone, one of two drugs used for medication abortion. As ranking member Raskin mentioned at the top of the hearing, 
Um, Mifid Pristone is subject to a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, um, also known as RIMS. During the peak of COVID-19, the FDA suspended enforcement of a RIMS requirement that Mifepristone be dispensed in person. Due to the success of this trial run, we know that in January 2023, the FDA permanently updated the strategy to remove the in-person dispensing requirement. This has proven that the in-person dispensing requirement was never actually medically necessary. I have a bill called the Protecting Access to Medication Abortion Act which would assume, assure that Mifepristone, one, does not have an in-person dispensing requirement, two, allows patients to access prescriptions for Mifepristone via telehealth, and three, authorizes all pharmacies certified to dispense Mifepristone to patients to do so via mail. So thank you for, to the FDA for your commitment to your evidence-based um, care that serves patients and not politicians. Next, I wanna turn to sickle cell a disease that affects approximately 100,000 people across our country, the majority of whom are black people, and about 2,000 people across my district. In fact, according to the CDC, one out of every 365 black children in the United States are born with sickle cell disease. It cuts at least 20 years from life expectancy. And so as a nurse, I've treated people with sickle cell disease. Patients experience totalizing pain, um, and it is debilitating. This illness completely takes over your life and it is heart wrenching and we don't speak enough about it. So last year, the FDA issued a groundbreaking approval of the first gene therapy to treat sickle cell disease. And so this new technology is the first genetic, um, the first time genetic editing has been used to treat any disease. As a result, patients who face excruciating pain and even death from sickle cell disease will now be able to better manage this life threatening condition for many who may have been unable to hold steady employment, spend time with friends and family, or otherwise participate in everyday life because of this illness, this is truly life altering and is life sustaining. This technology would be impossible without the diligent and the science driven work of the FDA. So uh, Dr. Califf, what did the FDA consider when determining the new sickle cell treatment, um, determining that it is safe and effective? As I believe you probably know, there are actually two um, mm -hmm. treatments approved, one using gene editing per se, and another using a viral vector. And um, in both cases, human clinical trials were done. Taking sickle cell patients, as you all know, uh, being a nurse, um, people with sickle cell disease, even though the genetic issue is essentially the same, um, the, the same area of the human genome, the manifestation of the disease is quite different. So what was done in these trials were to take uh, people who were having the worst outcomes, that is many attacks, uh, painful crises, and then doing the gene um, uh, um, effort, um, and then following them after and showing that those uh, crises abated almost completely. It was quite a remarkable result. But in a small group of patients, and so there's a lot yet to learn but it was important to give access to that treatment to those who would benefit. Mm, okay, okay. Um, is there potential for this new, um, this new treatment to be used to treat other genetic diseases? It's very exciting, and I alluded to it in my opening um, comments. You, you know, I was around for the Human Genome Project, and people for decades said, uh, where's the beef? You know, we put all this money into 3.2 billion base pairs and knowing what they are. Now we're here because thanks to the science, we can go in with molecular scissors and snip out the gene that's causing the problem and put in a new one, or snip out the gene that's causing the problem if we don't need to put in a new one. There are 10,000 rare diseases with no treatment right now. You're talking about parents of children who have terrible outcomes. And so this is such a revolution in terms of therapeutics that we're making major changes within the FDA, but it's got to go further than that because you're aware that um, the cost of these treatments is quite high. So I think there's going to be a lot for you in Congress to work with uh, the administration on here to um, figure out, you know, if, if you're a parent of a child with a rare disease now, there's hope that within a few years we could have an effective treatment. But if we have hundreds to thousands of effective treatments, the, the environment in which this is done has got to look different than it does right now.
I, I hope that was helpful. Yes, yes. Um, and I, the Chairman, do I, can I? Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. How can we ensure that people who require this, these genetic therapies aren't priced out? Because like you started to allude to. But <laughs> Well, I can take the easy out and say it's not, you know, it's not, as FDA commissioner on a hearing about FDA, it's definitely not in our remit. But I can assure you there are many discussions going on across HHS where, as you know, for example, in sickle cell disease, the majority of patients are on Medicaid right. because their medical costs are so high and the difficulty with um, jobs in a case where you're sick a lot um, that we've got to come up with new pricing schemes. and. I am, as an academic, a health policy person, but I, I shouldn't opine on that here at this hearing. I'd be glad to talk with you separately. Okay, I'll reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Higgins from Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Keller, thank you for being here. Your, your authority is vast and your responsibility is great, and you're a gentleman of distinguished stature, so I appreciate you being here today. Uh, you, you, you have to give serious answers to hard questions, and I, I do indeed have uh, some hard questions to submit to you, and Bobby submitting the more interesting questions in writing, uh, for the record, after the hearing. For legislative purpose, I have a specific line of questioning regarding imported seafood. This is what I'm going to be discussing with you. Uh, as a matter of background, according to my, my research and investigations, about 60 to 65 percent of seafood consumed in America is imported. And generally speaking, given the limited resources that you have at your avail, uh, you're, you're able to supervise the inspection of about one-tenth of one percent of imported seafood. Is that generally correct, sir? Well, we'd say it a little differently. First, and by our count, it's more than 65 percent of, of seafood. Right. I, I'm, this is the Republican side, so I'm being conservative. Okay. <laughs> and, but much as I described on the drug side just a few minutes ago, it starts with a digital inspection. That is, we have information about these facilities uh, and the, from the when, shipper and the owner and the importer. And as it comes in, um, their character, we use artificial intelligence now to look at the um, characteristics of the shipment to pick out. So it's not just the small number you referred to out of overall. It's a high-risk part of the um, import. that. Yes, and I, I, I appreciate that level of expertise and, and of course, the dynamics of, of uh, illegal imports are would include inspections beyond the, the, the biological and chemical realm. But according to a September 2017 GAO report titled Imported Seafood Safety, the FDA and USDA could strengthen efforts to persuade, to prevent unsafe drug residues in imported seafood. A whistleblower has come forward indicating that a company called Choice Canning, an Indian shrimp exporter, has knowingly shipped antibiotic contaminated shrimp to the United States. Despite this, FDA data shows that only 21 shrimp samples from this company have been tested since 2003. Just to put this in perspective, again, respectfully, sir, you have a massive job to do and l limited resources. I respect that. I don't want to help. The, this, this company that I'm referencing, the Choice Canning Company, which is a known violator, imported 24 million pounds of shrimp to the United States last year alone. So basically, it imported seafood is coming into our country, and the, the, the billions and billions of pounds, is very little of it is being actually inspected uh, for at the laboratory level for biological and chemical contaminants. And the reason we're not getting sick is because we cook the seafood. Basically, that's, that's the reality. So I would like to ask you, if you had some had legislation from this body that gave you teeth in your enforcement, like the authority and the mechanisms to destroy shipments that had been found to be contaminated, 
would that power be helpful for FDA enforcement of imported seafood that violates American standards for biological and chemical contaminants? You asked the question in a specific way that I'm reluctant to say just yes. What yeah, I would you say, say just yes. What I would say is in the general direction you're going, I would say in general, including this arena, um, the industries have by and large fought our ability to do what you described. Um, it's not just true in the area that you mentioned. Um, but in general, um, I believe we would exercise our, our authorities responsibly and could more quickly take care. I mean, there is stuff which sits there for a long time, given all the things we have to do in order to stop. Roger that. Well, we, we, my intention, and thank you, sir, I'm going to close by saying that my intention is to, is to legislatively empower the FDA to have very aggressive responses to shipments of contaminated seafood that enter our country. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Let me, let me thank you for that, and I'm a South Carolinian. I think our shrimp is better than yours, but um, <laughs> in any case, there's nothing I'd like better than to see a resurgence of the seafood uh, industry in the well, United States. Well, I've, I've learned from a young man not to argue with a gentleman in a bow tie, so I'll let you have that, sir. <laughs> Chair, now recognize Ms. Stainsbury from North New Mexico for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Califf, for being here today. It's wonderful to have you. I want to thank your staff for being here today as well. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to highlight the importance of science and science-based decision-making in this hearing and all that you are doing to protect the American people to ensure that we have access to medicines that work, that we have food that doesn't harm us, and to ensure that every American can get life-saving care. And also for your work in the administration's support of our work this last Congress to pass once in a generation legislation to expand access to health care, to invest in science and innovation, and of course to expand access to prescription drugs for our seniors. The FDA is truly on the front lines of that battle every single day, and we're really grateful for the work that you do. And I'll say on a personal note, I have a family member who was formerly an FDA employee, and you, you represent the best of the best that our country has to offer. And nowhere is this more important than in the realm of reproductive care, where we have to continue to follow the science and ensure reproductive freedom, especially in the face of unprecedented attacks. You know, as we've seen, Republicans in this body, in fact, in this room and across the country, have been working to ban abortion, first through Donald Trump's Supreme Court, uh, which overturned Roe versus Wade last summer, and then chipping away state by state to implement abortion bans, including where in Arizona just this week the courts upheld a Civil War era abortion ban. That's right, for folks that don't know this, this ban was put in place in 1864 before an end to slavery had been ratified by this body, before women could vote, and before Arizona was even a state. Let's be clear. <laughs> no judge, no politician, no person should be able to tell a woman, any woman in America or anywhere in the world, what she can do with her own body. And nowhere is this more important right now than in the United States Supreme Court, which we are all watching very carefully in the wake of their hearing of oral arguments in a case in which the FDA has been involved since the last couple of years over Mifepristone. So Dr. Kayleaf, I want to ask you a question. If you could talk to us a little bit, not only about the implications of the decision by the Supreme Court, which we're expecting this summer, for women to access reproductive care through medicated abortion, but also what are the wider implications for FDA's ability to use science to approve medicines? Well, thank you for the question. I have to um, note that this, since this case is under consideration by the Supreme Court, I'm very limited in what I could, can say. I will say that um, our um, we stand by our decisions. Um, they're still in play today. <clears throat> and um, I'll add that, you know, we do have concerns if judges start um, second-guessing FDA decisions about what that means for the broader area of 
having a rational uh, system of um, availability of medications and devices for the American public. Right, so the FDA approved Mifepristone to be used as a totally appropriate medicated way of addressing issues around pre reproductive care. And the broader implications are that if judges start uh, legislating from the bench on this kind of medicine, it could be anything. It could be cancer treatments. It could be any kind of medication or intervention in your health. And I think the American people need to understand the implications of this case, the potential impacts for public health, and the ability for it to impact every American's opportunity to access life-saving care. So we appreciate your work. Um, and I am personally thankful to be from a state, from New Mexico, that has worked to protect reproductive care. But if the Supreme Court does overturn FDA's decision to approve that medication this summer, we could see a ban on medicated abortion across the United States, including in places like New Mexico where it is protected. So that is why this body has to urgently take action. It's why we have to defend the science. It's why we have to sit here and defend our agencies who are making sure that American women and all people have access to the care that they need. And it's why we have to do everything we can to defend our institutions because the lives of our communities literally depend on it. Just Thank a quick you. comment, if I may. Uh, everywhere I go in the world, the, uh, our system of drug development and decision-making is the envy of the rest of the world. They all want to be like us in that regard. As I've already commented, um, our use of, dr of generic drugs in public health is falling a little short now with our drop in life expectancy. But the system that you described is one that it's very important that we preserve in general, um, in addition to the topic you're specifically talking about. Chair, now recognize Mr. Perry from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Cahill. I want to talk to you about the World Health Organization I, I, and the. My, World I'm sorry. My name is called all kind of things. It's oh, Caliph. Sorry. Caliph. I'm sorry. Sorry. I've, I've gotten a lot of different pronunciations here. <laughs> yeah, that, but I'm, that wasn't. I'm used uh, to that. That was an incorrect pronunciation. That was just plain <laughs> damn wrong. But um, I, I want to talk to you about this uh, this treaty. I think 185, maybe plus nations, including places like Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Cuba. Haiti, uh, and some terms in that. We haven't seen it. Um, we haven't seen the 30-plus amendments, so we're kind of shooting in the dark here, and I'm, I, I don't know that you know any more than any of the rest of it on, about it on, you know, than we do, but there was another draft uh, just last month that created a multilateral system for sharing pathogens with pandemic potential. I already listed some of the countries involved um, it also commits each party, which would include us if we were signatories, to promote timely access to credible and evidence-based information on pandemics. Um, and, and the aim there, I guess, is to combat misinformation and disinformation, I, I guess, as you see it or as they see it. So my question is with the potential threat to U.S. sovereignty for decision-making, on whether a pandemic even exists and the prescribed remedies, including lockdowns and, and, and maybe, maybe even medicating, would you commit before the committee today to pledge not to adopt policies included or pursuant to the treaty until such time and if such time as that treaty would be ratified by the United States Senate? I'm not sure how to answer that question, given the complexity of what you said, but I, it, it's hard for me to uh, imagine that we would do something at FDA that's not a government policy. Now, you referred to the Senate in particular. I'm just not familiar enough. Well, if the Senate doesn't ratify it, it wouldn't be a treaty that we would be signatories to, or at least not legally. And I just want some or to know if there's any intention on the FDA's part to institute any of the provisions within the treaty without the proper ratification from the United States uh, Senate. I don't think that particular issue would fall within our purview, So, and I don't know enough about it to, um, to make a commitment. I will comment that sure. we, um, 
You know, if we just look at the avian flu situation we're in now, the knowledge of the um, molecular structure of whatever the pathogen is turns out to be really, really critical to come up with countermeasures um, to treat it. And so I hope we can work out a way. And it also, even for food safety, we've talked about the imported food that we get. The um, genetic composition of the pathogen turns out to be really important. So um, I sure um, get what you're saying. We've got to do this carefully, whatever we do. But I hope there will be a way that, for example, we don't get exposed to a new pandemic where we know nothing about the organism until it's too late. We also, I think most people in America want to maintain their medical sovereignty, the individual medical sovereignty that we all enjoy. Regarding censorship, um, the CDC was involved in, in media companies taking down social media posts regarding misinformation and disinformation, again, terms that, that I think are loosely defined, but involved the FDA has been involved in this process in the, in the past, having awarded several grants in the range of hundreds of thousands of do dollars to places like the University of Maryland at College Park, Texas Women's University, regarding, again, uh, misinformation and disinformation. Commissioner Califf, has the FDA coerced social media companies to take down users' social media posts regarding the pandemic or any other topic due to what they describe as mis- or disinformation? Not at all to Not to my knowledge. So, so would you consider if you're paying, if the FDA is granting uh, organizations like the University of Maryland or Texas Women's University to mitigate the spread of misinformation or disinformation, that's essentially subcontracting out that, that duty you're saying the FDA hasn't done it particularly, but have they done it indirectly through their surrogates or their subcontractors via grant, the grant program? I'm not aware of the particular contract you're talking about, but let's remember that uh, throughout the entire the history of the FDA, the FDA considers data and information, makes a decision about a product, puts together the risks and benefits into a judgment as to whether it should go on the market. It's put in the label. The label is then transmitted to clinicians all over the country who then work with their patients to make decisions about what to do. The sovereignty that you refer to is typically a patient-doctor relationship based on that information. Places like University of Maryland has a ma major first-rate medical center. They're intermediaries in this process of relaying useful information. Now, if someone is saying something that's flat out wrong, um, you know, how that's dealt with by University of Maryland, that's their business. But it, but it also has the imprimatur of your approval, and when they found out to have been wrong in the past for coercing social media companies to take down so-called posts that then were later found to be incorrectly done, where is the remedy? And is there an apology from the FDA? Is there an admonishment from the FDA to these universities that have, that have been fast on the trigger and, and, and coerced and, and change the narrative or change behavior based on things that aren't true? Um, far be it for me to apologize for a university. I'm a longtime university person before coming to FDA, but I think what the university does is the university's business. Well, understand it also is a reflection on the FDA. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes uh, Representative Brown from Ohio. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Kayla, for coming before us today. On March 15th, 2023, Congresswoman Presley and I wrote to you urging an investigation into the link between chemical hair straighteners and uterine cancer. I would personally like to express my gratitude to the Food and Drug Administration for your rapid response and dedication to addressing this matter. I am pleased the FDA has already taken immediate steps with a proposed rule to limit the use of harmful chemicals found in many hair straightening products. As you know, black women experience scrutiny and discrimination regarding our hair, which has led to widespread use of these products. Black hair should not restrict our ability to learn in school or advance in the workplace, nor should our hair, our hair care products come with health risks. As the FDA finalizes this rule, I look forward to working together to ensure our consumer products remain safe for everyone. 
Furthermore, I know you are hard at work to protect Americans in other ways too. The Biden-Harris administration and Democrats continue to fight to protect and preserve women's reproductive rights. The FDA's recent landmark approval of over-the-counter birth control moves us one step closer to reproductive freedom, even amid brutal, backwards, and barbaric abortion bans like Arizona's and other attacks in reproductive health, including my own state of Ohio. Women, have the right to, women must have the right to control with, when, if, and how to start a family. Increased access to safe and reliable contraception provides space for that decision to be made while putting control back in the hands of women. So Commissioner Califf, what have been the impacts so far of over-the-counter birth control hitting shelves across America? Well, we're in the, we're in the early uh, phase of it, obviously, and there's always a lot to work out when something goes commercially because of pricing and all, but it, the availability I think as more um, manufacturers come on the market, given the precedent, um, we should see much more wide-scale availability so that um, people can use the products as indicated. Okay, thank you. And finally, one last issue I would like to touch on concerns a disease impacting far too many in the black and brown community. Roughly one in eight, one in eight black Americans live with diabetes, while in my district of Cuyahoga County, the black diabetes rate is over 25%, over one in four. Certain FDA approved weight loss drugs aid in obesity management for adults with weight related conditions like type two diabetes. For many, these drugs are life changing and life saving. Unfortunately though, these medications are often too unaffordable and inaccessible for those who need them most especially uninsured individuals. So Commissioner Califf, how is the DA working to ensure these new, highly effective treatments are reaching populations who need them most? Well, first of all, I um, appreciate your description of the problem. And um, there, are, there are special populations at much higher risk. You've referred to one, I'd say rural people in general are also suffering greatly, and it's one of the main reasons that we're seeing this uh, very troublesome decline in life expectancy. Right now, um, despite the fact that we're producing the majority of the innovations um, in medical products, we're almost in last place among high-income countries in terms of life expectancy and the disability and multiple chronic diseases that go along with it. Unfortunately, our tools at FDA specifically are very limited for what you described because we are limited by law in dealing with price or of products uh, when they come to market. This is a policy issue, though, for all of the administration and for Congress to consider. The one thing that we do that uh, when we have a product like a set of products like this that looks so effective so far. It's working with the manufacturers to get more products on the market because the competition uh, does bring the price down. But what you're referring to is most unfortunate. In many ways, there's a saying that I love. Um, it it's, makes you feel bad in a way, but it was in the Atlantic uh, during the pandemic. And technological solutions drift into society's penthouses. Diseases seep into society's cracks. And the problem is, here we have a highly effective treatment. Who's getting most of it? The wealthy and highly educated people. Who needs it the most? It's the people that you described who may have lower income um, and are, are in the need. So this is a major policy problem. I'm sorry the FDA is limited in what it can specifically do, but I can assure you that, for example, CMS is thinking hard about what it might do about this. Well, I thank you for um, your thoughtfulness, and I thank you and I, um, for this work that you're doing. And I look forward to continuing and staying in good contact with you. And with that, I yield the balance of my time. The chair now recognizes Mr. Palmer from Alabama for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Califf, in your testimony, you said the use of CBD raises safety concerns, especially with long-term use. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, were uh, – problematic, uh, including harm for male reproductive system exposure and exposure particularly concerning for children during pregnancy. Uh, 
the FDA is engaged in, in monitoring the use of CBD, is that correct? It's a little complicated because CBD doesn't fall directly under any particular reg regulatory scheme that we have. So Should when it? people do report things to us, we note it. And we've had funding from Congress to study the problem from independent studies that have been. I, I, I won't. Uh, I appreciate that, but my question is: Should should the FDA be more involved in monitoring CBD because it's becoming extremely ex uh, popular throughout the country? We very much would like Congress to establish a regulatory pathway for CBD. Well, I, I have a, an article from the Inst National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it talks about vaping. We also talked about vaping. I'm not going to get into that, but I, I do have major concerns about the products coming in from China, but I also have concerns about uh, the the lethality of, of vaping, whether it's tobacco or, or marijuana, and is that something that, that the FDA is actively engaged in, in monitoring? To the extent that we can, again, uh, as we discussed earlier today, the um, regulation of marijuana is another area where we would benefit greatly from Congress reaching agreement on a regulatory pathway that enables um, pr the prevention of harm from I'm being done. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I agree with you. Uh, this, this body in the 1990s recognized that the tobacco industry had worked to increase the amount of nicotine in tobacco, nicotine is not the, the carcinogenic that that uh, caused people to get lung cancer. It's the smoke, the tar, and the other uh, things from from um, inhaling the smoke. You you have some of the same issues with uh, marijuana uh, that that there's tar and other uh, uh, things that are ingested into the lungs. But the thing that I that concerns me about this as well is uh, and this this Congress acted, uh, I think, effectively uh, in dealing with the tobacco industry in the 1990s. But what concerns me right now is that we're not doing anything, uh, to my knowledge, uh, to regulate what's going on in the marijuana industry, and particularly the genetically modified products in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. As I reminded my colleagues, uh, uh, THC content was about 2%. Now it's anywhere from 17 to 28 percent, and that's the, uh, the the addictive part of of marijuana that affects the frontal lobe, that impacts judgment. And uh, what we're we're starting to see now, uh, again, it comes in different forms. You don't just smoke it; you could take it as a gummy. You could you could uh, get it as an oil, and and what's happening is more and more children are get, coming in contact with it. And uh, there's a, a report from from the um, National Center for Biotechnology Information that was in that are found in in the uh, medical uh, one of the medical pu publications that says that in terms of, of addiction, nine percent of those people who just experiment with it become addicted. Seventeen percent of those who start as teenagers become addicted, and anywhere from twenty-five to fifty percent of, of daily users. Um, is that uh, is that another area where the FDA needs to engage? Because we see more and more states legalizing this, so it's not a DEA problem; it, it, it's it's a consumer problem. I, I believe that this is a similar. Um area where harm reduction through a regulatory strategy is probably our best approach, and we need more research on exactly what the facts are. I remember that the tobacco industry was engaging in genetic um, uh, manipulation basically going way back just through the old-fashioned Mendelian um, radiation of the plant and then development of mutations that would lead to more and more nicotine in the product. And now we have uh, chemical synthesis, which can imitate almost any of these in a highly um, efficient way to produce the kind of effects that you described. So Increase addiction. We're, we're concerned, and we'd like to see a regulatory pathway, but in the, uh, we talked earlier about the fact, for the most part, the FDA is a referee, and we need a rule book, and you guys write the rule book. So we'd really like to see a rule book in this area. Commissioner? Caleb, I appreciate your answers. I yield back. And I have to comment on that. That's uh, 
we write a lot of rule books that we have trouble with this administration complying with the rules. Like they uh, sing to their own uh, drummer there, but anyway, march to their own drummer. Anyway, Chair now recognize Mr. Frost from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Like many of my constituents, I'm deeply concerned with the H5N1 avian flu outbreak. Um, it's uh, impacted birds, livestock, at least one person in Orlando lost several of our Lake Eola swans, which is in the center of uh, my district. It's a symbol of our city. Um, while it does seem clear um, that the avian flu is not currently able to spread easily among people, folks are still wondering about how safe they are. It's brought up a lot in my district. Commissioner, how is the FDA in coordination with the Department of Agriculture and the CDC ensuring that Americans have access to reliable and up-to-date information about this? Well, thanks for bringing this up. It is a very important um, issue today. As, as, as you have noted, avian uh, flu has been around for a while, but it's only recently that it's now infected um, cattle, and now cattle in multiple cows in multiple states. And so um, this is really an all-of-government effort. There are um, Zoom conferences multiple times a day now in, involving FDA, CDC, agriculture, as you said, but also uh, many other areas of government that um, have a stake in the game of interstate commerce and uh, Department of Justice and issues that are related. So we're all working together, and um, you should see frequent communications as we work through this, remembering that this is um, the most recent episodes with the cows is a relatively new thing. So we're starting with a lot of uncertainty and working our way through it. And since 2006, the federal government has stockpiled antivirals um, designed to prevent um, severe illness and death from the flu. Will this medication be effective against avian? Well, this relates to a discussion that we just had. It's very useful to know the molecular or genetic composition of the virus. And in this case, if you look at the composition of this virus, it, there's nothing in it that should confer um, resistance to the current antivirals that we have stockpiled. So we feel good about that. I should note it's always the case that when you have an actual illness, you have to empirically uh, prove that it works. And so Fortunately, right now, there's really only one infected human that we know of, so it's not um, something that we can test, but it looks good at this point. Thank you. I appreciate it, Commissioner. Something, another subject that's really important to me and is personal to me are allergies. Um, I'm, I'm a survivor of anaphylactic shock just a few years ago. That almost killed me. Um, I also want to make sure that the other 20 million Americans with food allergies know that what they're taking or what they're eating is safe. A recent study found that 93% of all medicines contain an allergen, and many popular over-the-counter allergy drugs contain lactose. Do you believe that the FDA has the power to require labeling of prescription and over-the-counter medicines for food allergens and gluten? We definitely have the power to require labeling when it's um, indicated. Three years ago, President Biden signed into law the FASTER Act, requiring labeling of sesame as a food allergy, and also requiring HHS to submit a comprehensive government report on food allergies within 18 months. Um, that report has not yet been submitted, um, and it's very frustrating to Americans with food allergies and their families. Does this report fall under the responsibility of the FDA, and if so, would you be able to provide an update on the status of it? I'll have to get back with you on that because I'm not familiar with that particular report, but um, we are very um, familiar with the fact that allergies in the U.S. are apparently growing and that there is a great need to make sure we get this right. Okay. Per yeah, we'd love to follow up on that. I think we even gave, gave a heads up about that question so you could be prepared, but it's all right. We'll follow up about it. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Representative McLean, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Commissioner Califf, you assumed the office of the commissioner of the FDA in February, February of 22, correct? That's correct. Thank you. When you assumed office, were you aware that a manufacturer who made more than 40% of the com country's infant formula was voluntarily recalling all the baby formula it made at its Sturgis plant. 
Um, I was very familiar because it happened on the day so, I was confirmed. So, so yes, thank I didn't you. Know before in the then. days and weeks, so I'll take that as a yes. In the days and weeks that came after you assumed office, were you aware that there was a shortage of infant formula across the country? Well, in the first days and weeks, there wasn't a shortage, but as the shortage evolved, I was very much aware of it. So yes, thank you. Were you aware that 10 states reached rates of over 90% of out of stock and nationwide 74% of stores had no infant baby formula? We, those numbers do not sound right to me, but there was a lot of out of stock and absence of formula. Directionally, what do you think they were? Could you say we were reaching crisis mode or we were just like short one or two cans? <laughs> It's closer to crisis than okay, one thank you. Count. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record two internal email exchanges within the FDA. The first dated February 4th, 22, in which the FDA officials are discussing the potential for infant formula supply uh, issues and asking for media support from the White House to educate the public. The second on February 19th of 2022, in which the FDA officials were discussing the supply issue that were already happening. Now, despite these discussions within the FDA, media reports, and the president was not aware of the problem. Even though it was headlining in nearly every uh, news channel and every paper across the country for three months. So my question is, did the FDA not raise concerns about the potential shortage even before the recall? As you know, there's a record of this. There's a supply disruption um task force that was put up during the COVID crisis that was also used for this purpose. Where so it was elevated? To the task force, which has Did the FDA government. raise concerns about a potential shortage even before the recall? Yes or no? I can't speak for before the recall, but at about the time of the recall. Okay, well, let me help you because I can tell you. <clears throat> the FDA did, in fact, raise the issues to at least nine different White House officials, and President Biden took no action. So I'd like to enter the record an email between the FDA and the nine White House staff, including members of the National Security Council, Domestic Policy Council, and the Special Assistant to the President for Public Health. Without this objection, so ordered. Thank you. This email, dated February 17th of 22, which was the day of the voluntary recall, shows the White House in communication with the FDA about the recall. So I'm just helping you out there. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter another email into the record, an email dated February 20th of 22, just three days after the voluntary recall, which shows the FDA chief of staff already raising concerns about an infant formula shortages and communicating this concern with the White House. With that right? objection, it's ordered. Commissioner, here's my question. Why did it take three months for President Biden to invoke the Defense Protection Act? I can't speak for President Biden and, and that particular decision. I will note, as I've already said, you know, I don't have the emails that you're referring to, but... I'll get them to your at, office, and I'll promise I'm you I'll, sure you I'll get them to you in a timely fashion. But, I guess my question but is... This, this but, evolved over time, so the exact timing of when the DPA should have been brought in is something that's a matter of discussion. A, a, a matter of discussion. That's your answer. I mean, so, so your office has been in communica communication with nine White House staffers? Either you didn't, the FDA didn't tell him, or he didn't act. Which is it? Yeah, I think you have the emails, and I can't really comment beyond well, that. Well, you know what baffles me is you make about two hundred grand. you are supposed to be in charge, but, but when the you-know-what hits the fan, everybody runs for the hills. I'm going to switch well, topics. Just, just hold on a minute. I, when I asked about, it's my time, sir. When asking about its handling of, uh, of, uh, of this is unbelievable. I mean, you don't know it. You don't have an answer. I'd love to have an answer, but well, I'm going to well, switch you gears. You overestimated my salary, which is a It's about $191,000, no, so that's pretty close. Not but even Commissioner that. Caleb, it costs millions of dollars to prepare pre-market tobacco product applications, PMTAs. Manufacturers have had products pending at your facilities for years. I know we have talked about this, and you know the concern of all the illicit and illegal um, products coming over from China. When do you anticipate getting some results from these Americans? 
American companies that have actually been waiting for over four years on their tobacco products. As we've already discussed, we're 99 percent done with the t almost 27 million applications. We have, you know, 1 percent left to go. These are big decisions, and they're going to be rolling out. We expect to be caught up, for example, with the ones that are largest from the American um, uh, pedi pediatric group that follows this by the end of this year. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. I yield time. Chair now recognizes uh, Representative Lee from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we've discussed today, the FDA has a critical responsibility to ensure that our food supply, medications, and medical products are safe and effective. But the FDA doesn't hold this responsibility alone. The agency does not have the resources to single-handedly ensure the integrity of every product produced by every food, drug, and device manufacturer. The private sector also has a critical role in ensuring that their products are safe, a responsibility that they, that they need to take seriously. Recent reporting has uncovered how Philips Respirotics, a Pittsburgh-based company and one of the largest medical device manufacturers in the world, received hundreds of complaints will, about its CPAC machines and ventilators prior to issuing a recall in 2021, a recall that ended up being one of the largest in history. Not only did the company receive hundreds of complaints from hospitals, providers, and patients as far back of 20 as 2010, but its own internal evaluations indicated their machines were toxic. Yet the company withheld this information from the FDA and the public for more than a decade. They continued to sell these hazardous machines, enabling their stock prices to soar to the highest levels in decades, while the most medically vulnerable in our communities, our infants, our seniors, our veterans, suffered. In Pennsylvania, there are now more than 700 personal injury lawsuits and class actions against the company due to irreparable harm its devices cause patients. Philips is one of the most egregious examples of what can occur when corporations don't take their responsibility to public health seriously. From COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing failures to dangerous lead levels in children's applesauce products, we've seen the private sector repeatedly fall short. Dr. Califf, what is the private sector's responsibility in ensuring that medical devices that are brought to the market are safe and effective? Well, as we've uh, discussed multiple times today, the primary first line responsibility is with, with the regulated industry. Um, this is a situation in which we oversee the industry, but the industry has that primary responsibility to produce safe and effective products, whether it's a device, a drug, or a food. So what investigative action or enforcement actions does the FDA have, or does the agency need to hold companies like Phillips accountable for regulatory noncompliance uh, and to deter future wrongdoings? And this has come up with regard to almost every commodity now that um, it would be better for public health, I believe, if we had direct recall capabilities um, across the spectrum of products that we regulate when we find problems uh, such as uh, you're referring to. I'd also like to see a bulking up of our um, post-market surveillance capabilities. After all, every American has an electronic health record now, and there's a lot that we can do so that we find out about these problems earlier than we currently um, are. And we need to make sure the manufacturers actually report in a timely fashion uh, when they do get um, problems that they're aware of. Uh, so over the years, the FDA has promised to overhaul the way it detects dangerous medical devices by relying more on real-time data in, in medical registries. Uh, what progress has the FDA made towards those goals? Well, I, you know, this is actually work that I've been involved in in my academic life for 30 years. So um, if you just think about it, everyone has an electronic health record. Every important medical transaction essentially is digitally captured now. Well, we have multiple blocks in the system that keep us from putting the data to better at, as best we can. So we're very dependent on voluntary registries where either companies pay for it or health systems pitch in and then the FDA buys the data. I'm pleased to say there's a lot of discussion um, with NIH and other parts of HHS now about having better data pooling capabilities so that we know about these things in real time. And we now have a model globally where it's happening in Israel where 100 percent of the population has real-time electronic health record accessibility to detect problems, but also, importantly, to find advantages. Sometimes there are surprises where something works better than expected. But right now, 
Uh, we don't know about it in real time. Okay. Um, looking at the time, I already know that I am not going to get through this next question, so I want to respect uh, yours and my colleagues' time and yield back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Burchett from Tennessee for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate you doing all this without a bathroom break. That's so it's great admiration for you there. Um, I have a question about the Farm Bill, 2018 Farm Bill. Um, it's about the cultivation cell and transportation of hemp-derived products. Since 2018, what regulations has the FDA put in place regarding hemp-derived products? Well, we have, a, I mean, we have a law from you all defining hemp as less than 0.3 percent THC. And what we've done, uh, you've given us money to study the problem and our conclusion uh, as it relates to human health is they're not safe enough to be called um, a dietary supplement or a food. And so we've asked Congress to put together uh, a regulatory pathway that will be appropriate. So these products are available, but they're labeled, they're identified, and in cases, for example, gummy bears packaged for children, uh, there's a way for us to take action quickly in those situations. Have any outside groups requested that the Food and Drug Administration regulate hemp-derived products? Yes, we've had uh, multiple citizens' petitions, but as I've said, um, the requests have been to regulate these as dietary supplements, and they don't meet the definition of a dietary supplement because of elevated liver enzymes and other um, health problems that we believe make them unsafe as supplements. But they could be regulated another way and made available if Congress thinks that's the right thing to do. Are you an MD? It's not in my notes, but you were saying some medical things there, and I'm curious. I'm a board-certified cardiologist, 35 years of intensive care unit and outpatient um, practice. Sadly, not practicing right now. Yes, sir. So you, would, so you would question whether we have a heart then, if you're a cardiologist. Is that correct? Let's just say the heart and the brain are two different things. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let the record reflect that our, that our uh, commissioner is punch drunk from being up here so long. So. But thank you, brother. Um, I, I am concerned about hemp, and I'll tell you why. It's not in my notes, and it always makes my people nervous when I do this, go off the thing. But, you know, hemp, <clears throat> my daddy fought in the Second World War, and I can remember, and I've seen videos of, you know, help, help us grow hemp to save the world. You know, they made rope out of it. And then, of course, it's a cousin of marijuana, but it doesn't have the THC level. And they come down here, and we pass this thing in the farm bill, and all these folks that want to grow hemp, <clears throat> they all say, oh, we've got the greatest thing in the world. But, dadgummit, I'm a United States congressman, and I've got a little farm. I checked into growing hemp. It's not, not going to make you a fortune, but I have to get a dadgum fingerprint to do it. It just seems to me that uh, the, the big boys in the cotton industry, I'm sure they'll be rushing up to my office right after I say this, but they wrote these dadgum regulations. You and I both know it. They don't want the competition. They don't want hemp in there. Hemp is, you know, you can watch the videos. It's, you know, these people say it's not the miracle that they claim it is because there's a huge labor factor involved in it. And it, and it really ticks me off that these folks have been fed this bill of goods and it's, uh, you know, it's just not happening. It's not, it's not happening like it should. And um, I'm wondering, have you, um, uh, anyone, you and your office, had any meetings with the cotton industry officials in which hint derived products were mentioned? I am not aware of any meetings with the cotton industry. It's, that would be an unusual industry for us to meet with, but... Uh, Due to the fact that you're not ingesting it, correct? No. Okay, well... And see, that's another problem with the product. You've, it goes to two different separate groups, and so that's, uh, I don't think that's, that, that, that is, I think that's by design, actually, the way, so that keeps it more complicated. Mm -hmm. Are you aware in the first two years of the Biden administration that the value of hemp production in the U.S. decreased by 71%? No? Nope. Not aware. Okay. I'll get away from the hemp thing. Um, and I've only got 30 seconds. The Center for Tobacco Products, I feel like they've continued to, uh, to, to not tell the truth, in some cases, to the American people. They tell us that vaping is harmful or more harmful than cigarettes, yet um, 
uh, let's see, Dr. Nancy Rigotti of Harvard concluded U.S. health agencies and professional medical societies should reconsider their caution position on e-cigarettes for quitting smoking. The burden of tobacco-related diseases is too big for potential solutions such as e-cigarettes to be ignored. Would you say that that's, well, I'm out of time, but you get where I'm going at. As, is, is it more harmful than cigarettes if it's used in, in um, if it's not over, if it's not Here, abused? Here's what I'd say. Um, combustible tobacco kills people. I was just over in uh, the UK because we're having a regulator I mean, I went to Oxford where Sir Richard Dahl did the British doctor study. The doctors who smoked died 10 years earlier than the ones who didn't. Vaping, if to combustible tobacco didn't exist, you'd be horrified by what's in the residue from vaping. When you think about that going into your lungs sure. over the course of decades, it's pretty horrifying. Um, but it's much less toxic in terms of all the things that cause cancer and heart disease. Um, the vaping than the combustible tobacco. So that's why uh, the term has been used, harm reduction, to say if you got someone using combustible tobacco, they're a lot better off uh, if uh, they're vaping, at least by those criteria. But compared to using neither, there's no question that there's no benefit of vaping other than if it helps you get off a of combustible right. tobacco. Uh, tobacco is the one product, if used, if used as directed, will kill you. So I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I went way over. Uh, Mr. Raskin, apologize to you too, brother. Uh, Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Chair, Chair, I recognize Mr. Garcia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Califf. I appreciate you being here and all your work and the work of the FDA. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about a different topic, but I just want to clarify some of the truly insane uh, attacks uh, on vaccines and just what happened during the pandemic that we heard a little bit earlier today, uh, which I found to be really wild. I, I just want to reiterate that during the pandemic, we lost 1.3 million American lives. Uh, in my city alone, we lost almost 1,300 lives uh, back home in California in, in the city of Long Beach. And we know that many of the folks that we lost would have lived if they had had access to the vaccine or had been vaccinated. We know that for a fact. Uh, we know the success of vaccines, and certainly today with more data, we know how effective they've been. What's concerning now, as we know, is as early childhood vaccinations are reaching new lows. We're having other diseases come forward, like measles and other uh, diseases that we are now not addressing because all of this vaccine denial that is happening, um, unfortunately, not just across this country, but also here in Congress and in this chamber. Vaccine hesitancy outside of what happened to COVID-19 is going to cause this country great harm. And instead of doing the responsible thing, earlier today we had uh, folks on the other side attack vaccines with, in my opinion, conspiracy theories and with treatments that we know are ineffective and have shown not to, not to work. Uh, we also know this is not just a matter of personal choice. Across the country, there are millions of people who don't have the choice and who, can, who cannot get vaccinated because they might be too young, they might, they might be immunocompromised, or have other underlying health conditions. And so America's high vaccination rates is something that has helped our country for so long that the FDA has been so involved with, and it's very concerning that our vaccination rates and our vaccine process is being attacked. I also want to, to note that there, is, um, there have been um, comments made uh, over and over again about vaccines, about somehow vaccines causing turbo cancers or vaccines causing miscarriages or that the COVID va vaccine somehow um, has um, no effect on healthy people that are all false. And I know that you uh, know this, your team knows this, and I just want to re reiterate that for, uh, for the public. What, what I did want to say, and I, I have less time to do so, but I want to just to transition and just thank you and your team for what you're doing as it relates to listening to the LGBTQ plus community. Myself as an openly gay person, um, I really appreciate the FDA's uh, move and decisions um, allowing um, particularly gay men to be a part of the solution when it comes to health, when it comes to blood donations, when it comes uh, to, other, to other forms of, uh, of, of surrogacy. Um, the FDA has really stepped forward and especially on the recent change in guidelines um, as it relates to the LGBTQ plus Americans 
and gay men being able to donate blood. I think that as a gay person, it's comforting to know that if there was an emergency where my blood or other blood was, was needed, that we would have that same right. And um, thanks to all of you. Um, Dr. Califf, in the time I have remaining, could you describe the FDA's da draft proposal and how this helps advance equality while also expanding the donor pool as it relates to the recent uh, changes you guys have all, you're all making? All right, simply, uh, first of all, let me just say, I appreciate your comments. Just back on the vaccines, I can't strike, I just one point I want to make. Um, all medical interventions have risks as well as benefits. We, in the earlier discussion, if you want to be alive and not be in an intensive care unit, you're better off getting vaccinated. There are some people that have side effects. I just want to note that because it's um, important to take care of those people also, but the benefits far outweigh the risks. Simply put, the question that, you asked, uh, people had raised this issue about donation for many years, and we did a study which showed that a questionnaire about behavior can do much better than just the time-based thing um, related to um, the LGBTQ community. So um, we, we uh, are well along in that now, and um, it looks like it's really going to work, and we'll be consistent with what other countries are doing. So we're really glad we were able to come to this conclusion. Great. Well, thank you very much for your work and, and for your team's work. I yield back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Fry from South Carolina. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, thank you for being here. Uh, Congress enshrined harm reduction as a uh, kind of a pillar in the 2009 Tobacco Control Act. The FDA's 2017 strategic plan embraced that harm reduction uh, with the former FDA commissioner noting successfully uh, that successfully implementing harm reduction could dwarf the introduction of any new medical technology and its positive impact on our public health. Unfortunately, the Center for Tobacco Products' current leadership under the Biden administration seems to have abandoned um, harm reduction as a foundational principle of its tobacco policy by refusing to authorize other tobacco products uh, that have been pending before your agency for years. Uh, your agency is failing to acknowledge the need for real change to provide better options for 28 million American smokers. A recent study from Yale University found that for every 0.7 milliliters of e-cigarette e-liquid that goes unsold uh, due to flavor restrictions, 15 additional cigarettes are sold. Uh, it was also found that e-cigarette flavor restrictions in place for at least a year yielded 20% increases in sales of cigarette brands disproportionately used by underage smokers. Can you explain why the FDA and the CTP have authorized 900 new cigarettes in the time that it has authorized only a handful of vapor products? First of all, um, I, we haven't abandoned the principle that you described, but it's a little more complicated than that. It's a responsibility of the company to produce a data set that shows that the benefits of smoking, of combustible tobacco reduction exceed the risks due to getting teenagers addicted. Vaping products get people addicted to nicotine if it's a new user. So we've always got to balance that risk of getting millions of teenagers addicted to the benefit to adults with combustible tobacco. Uh, so there are 23 products now on the market that um, have met that standard, and other companies are welcome to submit their data and produce the data showing that um, they meet that public health standard. Does CTP still believe in the continuum of risk of nicotine products, and does the FDA think it's helpful for adult smokers who would otherwise continue smoking cigarettes to switch uh, from combustible cigarettes to smoke-free alternatives? Yes or no? There's not a yes or no answer to that, because for adults, the best thing to do is to stop using tobacco products altogether. The second best would be to switch to um, a vape, but the very best would be to be, as we already discussed, if you look at the residue from vaping relative to no use of any tobacco product, it's you know, raises a number of issues over the long I, I think the concern that I have, sir, and I think the concern that many people share is that that there is, seems to be an abandonment of a congressional, in, not only intent, a, a, a directive that we're going to pursue harm reduction as an actual strategy in the country. And if you have 900 cigarette uh, that have been approved and only a handful of vape or other products, that seems to be divergent to what Congress has, has outlined for your agency. Would you not agree with that? I'm not familiar with the 900 term, so I'd have to go back and look at that. But um, we have not abandoned the idea that um, the company should show that it can successfully transition people from 
combustible tobacco to vaping in a way which does not increase the risk to teenagers of getting addicted to nicotine and therefore being susceptible to switching to tobacco. So in addition to vaping, you have other products like Zen or something similar to that. Would you consider that to be a harm reduction product? You know, we discussed this early. Um, the term harm reduction is tends to be used by industry to cover a lot of different areas. But um, if there's a product that can cause someone to stop using combustible tobacco um, and not get teenagers addicted to nicotine, that's a benefit. Commissioner, there seems to be some, you know, reading about the FDA, there seems to be some, some pretty heavy backlog within the agency. Um, how are you utilizing your workforce to, 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 to uh, innovate the FDA, and what type of metrics are you using to make sure that you're, you're being productive, not only for companies that have products that go before you, but for the American people? As we discussed earlier today, I think everyone was surprised by the over 26 million applications that came in, and there was a big backlog, and we, we've now cleared 99 percent of that backlog. But just like all other parts of FDA, when applications come in, they're tracked. We keep track of where we are, and as we're employing better technology and um, we're just going through some organizational changes, uh, you're welcome to read the Reagan Udall report that we commissioned to guide us there. So we're hard at work. We want to meet the timelines like we do in all the other product areas, and we're going to do that as fast as we possibly can. Uh, you make a good point there. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, now recognize Ms. Presley from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Commissioner, for joining us today. Um, first, let me just uh, also acknowledge and thank you for your responsiveness and your swift action. Uh, on my outreach to you regarding uh, formaldehyde and chemical hair relaxers, uh, also um, the shortage of children's Tylenol and Motrin. Uh, personally, as someone living with alopecia totalis, I also appreciate your efforts in that regard. Uh, and finally, for the purposes of my question line today, uh, reproductive justice. Uh, Dr. Uh, Califf, last year the FDA took pivotal steps to protect medication abortion access, including by allowing abortion pills to be prescribed by telehealth and distributed by retail pharmacies. Medication abortions accounted for 63% of all abortions performed in the United States last year. If mifepristone is pulled from the market, access to routine medical care would be jeopardized for people across the country. As part of their draconian, unpopular goal for a national abortion ban, let's call it what that is, forced birth, which for many will result in forced uh, death, Republicans continue to try to block access to medications like mifepristone by spreading baseless conspiracy theories. The fake news is rampant. I have a teenage daughter, and uh, we like to play a game called Two Truths and a Lie. So if you'll indulge me, we're going to do some variation of that right now. I want to use my platform to clarify some of this disinformation by playing a game called Fact or Fiction. Dr. Caleb, I'll say a statement, and you'll reply with just one word, stating if it is fact or fiction. Let's start with this. Fact or fiction. The FDA conducted a rigorous review of extensive research on mifepristone. Correct, that's a fact. Mifepristone has been on the market for almost 24 years, and more than 100 studies have affirmed its safety since. Fact or fiction, judges know better than public health experts if medication abortion is safe. Because the Supreme Court is currently um, adjudicating um, a case that involves it. But I am on record, and uh, so are all of us, that it would be bad for the entire system of drug development and availability of medications in the United States if judges begin overruling the Thank FDA you. as a matter of routine. Thank you. So that's fiction. The FDA, not the courts, determines the safety of drugs. Fact or fiction? Mifepristone is a form of medic as a form of medication abortion is safe and effective. Fact. Correct, that's fact. Research shows that less than 1% of patients experience serious side effects, posing fewer risks even than Advil or Tylenol. 
The facts are adding up. Mifepristone is a safe, effective, and routine form of health care that remains necessary and legal across the nation. Now, uh, this may be a game for today's hearing, but unlike Republicans, I have no interest in playing games with people's lives. And this is gravely serious. For many, especially black women, pregnancy and childbirth can be life-threatening. Now, I know this is a shock to the far-right extremist, old white men making these decisions, but there are hundreds of reasons why someone might want or need to terminate a pregnancy with medication abortion, and policymakers and judges should not be the ones making decisions for them. If Republicans and anti-abortion extremists have their way, access to Mifepristone will be cut in every state, blue or red, even in my district, the Massachusetts 7th, where abortion care is legally protected. Since I've been elected to Congress, I've been proud to lead the uh, Abortion Rights and Access Task Force under our Pro-Choice Caucus, fighting alongside my colleagues for Mifepristone access. I'll continue to fight to affirm abortion care as the fundamental human right that it is, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, and I yield. Chair now recognizes Mr. Burleson from Missouri for five minutes. Dr. Califf, um, in May of 2022, you made an appearance on CNN and claimed that the leading cause of death in the United States is, as you quoted, misinformation. Um, do you recall being on that interview? Do you recall making that statement? Okay. You're right, because the claim that you went on to say that co in COVID, um, that you need to get vaccinated, saying, quote, somehow the reliable, truthful messages are not getting across, and it's being washed out by a lot of misinformation, which is leading people to make bad choices. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to a tweet that I know that you're familiar with. On the post board, it says, you're not a horse, you're not a cow, seriously, y'all, stop it. Another sarcastic tweet from the FDA read, hold your horses, y'all. Ivermectin may be trending, but it isn't authorized or approved to treat COVID-19. The FDA put out these messages in 2021 and made similar posts on the other platforms to discourage people from using Ivermectin to prevent or treat COVID. In January 2022, the FDA sued, was sued by a number of doctors who claimed that you were practicing medicine as an organization. Um, as part of that settlement, you were forced to delete these. Is that correct? That's correct. So, in fact, the U.S. Court of, the, of Appeals said the FDA is not a physician, and even tweet-sized doses of personalized medical advice are beyond your statutory authority. Is that correct? That's what the court said. Pretending to take Ivermec that ivermectin is dangerous or claiming that it's horse medicine, would you not agree that that's the exact definition of misinformation? I would not agree with that. There are very well done randomized trials showing no benefit of ivermectin. And, and you knew that in 2021? I was not at the FDA. No, you didn't know that in 2021, and yet... Trust me, I was not at the FDA in 2020. Dr. Califf, I'll ask the questions. In, even to this day, you have to correct misinformation about, about ivermectin because you created a narrative that the product, which... Let me ask this. Ivermectin has had... It, it, was, it won the Nobel Prize, did it not? Won the Nobel Prize for the treatment of worms. That in humans. In, worms, in humans, right? Worms and humans. And next to penicillin and aspirin, it's considered one of the wonder drugs for use and its effectiveness in humans. For correct? treating a variety of um, infections that would commonly be known as worms, not for COVID. And it is a, it is a medicine for animals also. Both are valid uses. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, you, you created, in my opinion, I, and I think that it's obvious because you're still to this day having to correct people who think that a, a form of treatment that has been used, how many times would you say historically has ivermectin been successfully used in medical treatments? Successfully used for worms, but no effective treatment for It's been administered in humans billions of times 
over the last, what, 30 years? Correct? Again, for the treatment of worms. <laughs> Dr. Califf, um, what, let me ask this. What, do you think that, the, that tweets like this garner credibility to an organization like the FDA? Do you think that snarky tweets that I would think that my teenage daughters might write, do you think that that garners credibility with the FDA and the American people? I can't really comment on that. And again, I wasn't at the FDA when that tweet was put out. Well, I, I would, um, I'm glad that the, the courts told you to remove the, these tweets because it is snarky. It, I think it's demeaning to the American people and certainly demeaning to people, I believe, in my district. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. I'm going to try to get a quick question in here, Commissioner. You had mentioned uh, in a previous question talking about uh, hemp-derived CBD oil, that is non-THC or 0.3 or less. You, you mentioned that you didn't think the FDA could ever approve that as a nutraceutical. Is that, is that the FDA's position or not? Because there are a lot of people in the industry, in the, C, in the hemp-derived CBD industry, that believe that uh, CBD should be treated as a nutraceutical, just like supplements and vitamins at, at GNC and Vitamin World and places like that. You're correct, and we've had a number of citizens' petitions from people that have had that belief, but the research shows, uh, for example, elevation of liver enzymes, which uh, are very concerning that if people take this over time, that there's going to be damage to the liver, which could lead to things like liver transplants. So. And, and I have to say this, and I've seen this in, in Kentucky with many different CBD, CBD uh, manufacturers, there's a big difference. Their CBD entities, because it's the Wild West, because the FDA won't regulate uh, this product, there are companies with labs that would be as good as anything that Merck or Johnson & Johnson would have, and there are people operating out of the garage of their house. So the, the reputable CBD manufacturers in America, I believe, strongly hope that the FDA will come in and, and tr you know, not just take samples, because these companies aren't all the same. You agree with that, right? I'd say that's a characteristic of every industry that we regulate, and often the good players are penalized because of things that right. the bad players do. That's, that, right. that's one of, you know, I come back to the referee analogy. That's where a good referee can be very helpful, but the referee needs a rule book that says, here are the rules, and you guys write the rules, so we would really like it if... Well, I, I plan on uh, trying to play a small role in that moving forward, but thank you. Now, Chair recognizes Ms. Crockett from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Dr. Califf, thank you so much for being here. You know, uh, you are a brave man. Uh, I don't know who would want to sign up for your job, uh, especially in a time in which it seems like we don't believe in science, uh, or, or we don't know what data is, or we just gonna ignore it. I, I'm not really sure. I don't know how long you were asked about ivermectin. And let me tell you something. I don't know if you've ever testified in court, but you will be a great witness because you refused to answer the way that he wanted you to, which would have been, um, again, putting out misinformation. Because um, I do want to do a quick level set on something. And I don't know how we continue to come back to this. But let me just ask you a few questions. Was COVID-19 real? Yes, I had it myself twice. I think twice, once or twice. Did people die? Just in the U.S. alone, over a million people, it was in the top three causes of death for many months. And I had friends, you know, I was an intensive care unit doctor. When I came to FDA, I stopped practicing, but my friends in ICUs were overwhelmed. Hospitals had to have trucks backing up to the hospital because there wasn't enough room for all the dead people. And did vaccines save lives? Yes, thank you for asking that again. Um, people that are up to date on their vaccines have a significantly lower risk of being dead or admitted to an intensive care unit compared to those who are not up to date on the vaccine. And the worst of all are people not vaccinated at all. That's true on the individual level. If you look at counties in the US, the counties with a higher vaccination rate have lower 
death rates from COVID. If you look at countries, you see the same general relationship. So the vaccines have been highly effective. Thank you so much. Not for that. perfect, but highly effective. I, I understand. I don't know that there is any perfection. I know that there's none in this chamber. Nevertheless, um, as a result of an administration that believes in science and data, we now have ARPA-H, which ARPA stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. And my district, luckily, was the recipient of an ARPA-H customer service um, ex customer experience centers. And I'm so excited because this means that as we are looking at trials, as we're looking at diversifying them, we will have a great opportunity right there in Texas 30. It is a huge investment in science to make sure that we can save lives. And when the next pandemic arrives, we will actually be prepared and have science so that we can stay on top of this. Because the last time I checked, and doctor, correct me if I'm wrong, um, having a leader suggest that we should inject bleach, are you, are you aware of anyone being cured of COVID-19 because they injected bleach into their body? I am unaware of any such thing. If, if I might comment in general, and this relates back to the discussion about ivermectin. In my, you know, I came along when heart attacks, no one knew what caused a heart attack. That was what I focused on. We tried a hundred different things for the treatment of heart attack. Only a couple of them worked, the others didn't. And the only reason we knew what worked is we went from the idea to doing a well-conducted study, a randomized trial, and then if it worked, then all the practitioners began to adopt it and use it. So we now treat heart attacks by going to the cath lab, opening the artery, and some medicines that work. Ivermectin has been studied multiple times in randomized trials, no benefit. But it is highly effective for the treatment. I use the word worms as a generic term for the kinds of infections that typically occur in places like Asia that can be devastating. It got a Nobel Prize because it's effective yeah. for those, and it's been a, a lifesaver. But it's been ineffective in COVID. I completely understand. Um, it, the, the last area that I'm going to touch on in my last 45 seconds, because I am a woman out of the state of Texas, there is no way that I am going to have a conversation and not talk about reproductive access. Um, so out of curiosity, um, would you consider the medical management of a miscarriage to be potentially a life-saving usage, yes or no? I have to be, I have to decline to answer that because that is perfectly fine. by the Supreme Court. That is perfectly fine. I'm going to tell you yes, but I'm going to give you another uh, question that you can answer. Would you consider uh, erectile dysfunction as a life saving usage for Viagra? Not life saving. Not life saving. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you that based on my research, that mifepristone actually has life saving characteristics, yet Viagra doesn't. And for those that don't know, Viagra, from my understanding, is actually nearly 10 times greater as it relates to risk of death. Yet for some reason, it's not sitting in the court right now. And I do appreciate the fact that you laid out that when it comes down to getting drugs approved, they actually go through trials. It's not just randomness. You take the randomness, you then say, maybe there's some evidence here, and then you put it through the ringer. After putting it through the ringer for decades, women's lives have been saved. And as a representative from the area that Roe v. Wade actually initiated, I am appalled because for whatever reason, some people want us to go back to horse and buggy in this country. And I think since now maybe we have the internet, maybe we should take advantage of it. And we shouldn't say that we should remain in the times of horse and buggy. And so with that, thank you for the work that the FDA does. I respect your research. I recognize that the courts don't do research. I also recognize that this chamber seemingly doesn't care about research. But because of the work that you do, there are lives that are being saved. And I need you to be funded to the fullest extent to make sure that we can continue to save American lives. Thank you. Chair, recognize Mr. LaTurner from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, thank you for being here today. FDA holds the responsibility of ensuring the safety and integrity of our nation's food, drugs, and consumer products, a responsibility that not only impacts our economy, but also the health and well-being of every American citizen. 
However, this FDA has failed to meet its mission statement and is defined by crisis from persistent drug shortages to the most significant disruption to the infant formula market in history. We cannot afford to overlook these critical failures. The well-being of all Americans depends on it. Commissioner, I look forward to hearing from you today and on how to address these pressing issues. Despite the backdrop of food and product safety issues plaguing your organization, FDA continues to chase nutrition-related policies like front-of-pack labeling, which are arguably outside of FDA's purview. Can you explain to the committee what authority you feel FDA has to pursue nutrition labeling policy while heavy metals exist on our food supply? Illicit Chinese tobacco products remain accessible, and 263 drugs remain in shortage. We actually have a law that instructs us about uh, food labeling um, that uh, we're adhering to in this case, and I would remind you we have a shortened life expectancy in this country, particularly in rural areas that's largely driven by diet and poor nutrition. It seems to me, I'm just from South Carolina, it seems to me that putting the information on the front of the package is probably more likely to get the useful information so people can make wise choices. That doesn't seem to me like something that should be uh, that hard to get to. If you put it on the back, if you're like me when you go to the store, you're unlikely to look at can, it. Can you, tell me where you can you tell me where you derive the authority to do it, though, specifically? Yeah, we, I'll be glad to get with your staff and go through the details of that, but we believe we do have that authority. I look forward to seeing that. Do you feel it's best, it's a best use of taxpayer dollars to shape American eating patterns in lieu of addressing these other critical issues? I listed a few issues that are, seem like a pretty big deal, and you feel like... I, I, certainly tobacco this, is a huge one. But I'd, I'd have to say, if we look at the fact that we have the lowest life expectancy of any high-income country, it's being driven by chronic diseases, which are being driven by diet. And so to say that we should pay no attention to diet um, is a mistake. Now, shaping, what we're doing is proposing to give people the information they need so that they can make healthy choices and reduce these alarming rates of obesity, diabetes. I'm a cardiologist, vascular disease. I tell my cardiology colleagues we got no problem with business in the future in cardiology. I, I pointed, going. I'd, I'd only have a limited amount of time. I pointed to front of pack labeling as an example, but it appears the agency has a number of outstanding rulemakings and goals that are not related to food safety. The definition of healthy, a symbol for healthy, the dietary guidelines for Americans, dietary guidance statements, the list goes on. Can you please tell the committee and consumers how all of these pieces fit together? M my concern is, that not only are you pursuing actions that you do not have the authority for, but you are also painting a terribly confusing landscape of rules and advice about what to eat. Well, be happy to work with your staff on going through this in more detail, but in short, what we now know about diet, it's a pattern of eating over time that's important and how long people live and whether they're burdened by chronic diseases. It's not one specific thing it's multiple constituents of the diet when, when eaten regularly in a pattern um, create the kinds of health problems that are really ravaging our country right now. If you look at rural areas in particular, we're seeing alarming premature death rates that are going in the wrong direction, actually, for the first time in 50 years. I, my question, you said that earlier. My question is specifically all of these different initiatives, how they work together, and I look forward to getting an answer on that to my actual question. It's been brought to my attention that illicit flavored disposable e-cigarettes now make up a majority of the entire e-cigarette market, which most of these products are coming from China. Can you speak to the factors that have allowed this issue to materialize and what your agency plans to do to rectify the situation? Yeah, thanks. I mean, we've, we've uh, been over this several times already this afternoon, but in, in brief, um, no one anticipated 27 million applications for uh, vaping uh, products when the door was open for applications. Uh, it has been um, a problem that is quite large and that we're gradually making progress in as our what, review. What are, what are you doing about it? Uh, warning letters, civil money penalties, injunctions, and seizures, all of the above. Um, and I hope that um, we'll continue to be able to increase our presence out there in the field. Right now we get no user fees from the vaping industry and that money would enable us to put a lot more people in the field to take down these 
operations that you're talking it, about. It sure feels like warning letters aren't getting the job done. Can you walk us through whether and how you personally, personally have communicated these concerns to DOJ and Customs? We've had direct uh, meetings and I've personally gone to several places of import to meet with the uh, Border Patrol and Customs people who are there when the uh, stuff comes in. By the way, if you want to get an education on this, go to the International Sh Mail Facility. What, what about the DOJ? Direct person-to-person -person okay. meetings with DOJ. Okay. I have the key person's cell phone number to call okay. in off hours. I'm over time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Chair, now recognize Ms. Tlaib from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we're almost done. <laughs> I, um, I'm really pleased that you're here. Uh, I had um, the last two weeks uh, a handful of community events, and FDA issues did come up. Um, I want to start with this. You know, how much of what FDA is doing covering specifically food safety? I mean, how much of your resources right now is, des is dedicated to food safety? Yeah, for, for detail, I would refer you to the Reagan Udall report that we commissioned last year that go has the detailed information. Is it like 50 percent? Nowhere near 50 percent, okay. although the F in food and FDA stands for food. Yeah. On the medical product side, we've had very good funding because sure. of the user fees, but not on the food side. Um, Mr. Chair, I do, I do want to submit um, for the record uh, an article, the FDA's food failure. Without objection, so ordered. And I need to talk about this because it comes up a lot. Um, FDA right now has the authorization to regulate water to keep uh, deadly toxin out of produce, right? The water is actually a mixed. Uh, we regulate bottled water. The water supply itself is regulated by uh, EPA, as just um, noted. Water on farms, as it uh -huh. uh, goes from where cattle may be, for example, well, to plants, that's yeah. an area that Yeah, Commissioner, I wanna, so I'm going to read from the article. I think this is important, just as background. And I know it was like a couple months maybe after you got confirmed. Quote, by the time FDA officials figured out it was spinach that was making people sick in 10 states, sending three people into kidney failure, it was too late. It was mid-November 2021, and the packaged salad's short shelf life had passed. There was no recall. By the time FDA officials got inspectors on the ground, spinach season was over. The fields in the production facilities were empty, which made it impossible to pinpoint the source of contamination. What caused the outbreak was likely never fixed. Have we fixed this kind of issue? Again, what was suspected because of previous kind of contamination, it is the food, is, is, it could be the water that's used to, uh, that touches the food, used to clean the um, produce. You know, when you say, is it fixed? You know, what I would say is uh, the economist rated the U.S. food safety as tied for first in the world, know, but, but is it completely fixed? Yeah, of look, I, I, I work on Get the Let Out Caucus. My colleagues know I'm a leader on this on issue around quality of water. I wanna help you. This is more me trying to show my colleagues that if we really cared about food safety, which every single one of our constituents doesn't use every single medication that everybody talked about, but they sure heck uh, gather produce, uh, touch the food industry in every way. And so I just want to get to the bottom of what we can do together to ensure that you have authorization to oversee water quality that touches our food. All right, we're just finalizing now. Um, you know, there are 10 rules of FSMA, food safety modernization. Yes. The agricultural water rule is one that's very pertinent and it has to do with what farms should do. For example, if there are cattle upstream from sure. where the produce is. And so, you know, there's a list of things we need. We'll, we can be in touch with your staff. So we don't really have anything right now that gives you any authority over water, the use of water on, on produce. Only in reaction to what happens, but not... So after contamination. Yeah, not preemptive. Okay. Well, that's important for us to know, and I hope the chair and I and others can work on this. The other question I have, and it's regarding food too, and, and I'm sorry, I know your medical background, but food is, is so incredibly important here. Does the FDA have authorization um, to oversee food packaging, right? Yeah. How about PFAS, the use of PFAS? What, what, what are we doing about the use of um, packaging around PFAS, As which is PFAS for our chemicals? relates to um, the surfaces of food containers, and sure. like I was surprised to hear that we even regulate dishwashers when yep. I came in because of this. Um, uh, yes, and um, it's a big... Uh, so how do, we, how do we do it? Um, 
we have studies that sample, but at very low rates because the funding is quite low. So we don't really enforce it? Not, not to the extent we could. I, let me just say, you know we're going through, uh, as we've discussed, the largest reorganization in the history of the yep. FDA. Food is the entire focus of... Yeah, Commissioner, I mean, I hear that we have some of the highest rates of cancer in the world. Is that correct? Um, we do. Yeah, I, I, I really think we should really prioritize. So when we talk about reorganization FDA, I do uh, hope and, and that we can work all together in a bipartisan way to make sure that food safety is, is at the center of making sure that we have resources. Again, this is just me I, highlighting to my colleagues and really educating the American public that we need to do more around food safety. I, I appreciate that. I do want to point out our new head of the Human Foods Program is Jim Jones, who, who had, had a career at EPA. He's an expert on the kinds of things that you've raised, and our reorganization plan would call for really beefing up the chemical safety yes. part of FDA because we've had a very small staff historically in that area. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think the EPA is moving, um, you know, it's slow, but they're moving towards trying to, again, prevent exposure of PFAS through other ways. But the fact that we're trying to stop it within water, within, uh, again, contamination on our environment, earth, and so forth, I think we have to really be as aggressive um, when it comes to uh, our food quality. Last question, if I may, um, and I promise this last question, you gave somebody else an option. Um, do you believe our country is experiencing a vaping epidemic? To the extent epidemic is uh, defined as millions of people, yes. Okay. What do you think we need to do as a Congress to protect our residents, especially our children right now? And I know we got questions about it, but like, what do you think we should do? Because vaping comes up so much for all of us, no matter if we're Republican, Democrat. Well, I, I think it has to be prioritized. Um, we need more resources. Is it, is it the disposables? I, I, We're not authorizing? The, yeah, that, that'll be the last question, okay. but feel free to answer that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. We, um The vaping industry doesn't pay user fees, and so we have a limited staff dedicated to this. We really need to ramp up our staff. That would be the most important thing you could do, and you're doing a good job of staying on our case. I'll say that. So that needs to continue. It's part of the process. Right, Chair, Chair, now recognize Mr. Cloud from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for sticking with us through the day. I appreciate you being here. Your agency, of course, is responsible for the evaluating the safety and effectiveness of medications that millions of Americans rely on. Um, and I'm sure that your scientists and those working there view themselves as committed public servants. I wanted to talk to you, though, about something that is concerning, I think, to a lot of Americans, and that is... Uh, potential conflicts of interest. Um, in 2018, the Journal of Science found that 11 out of 16 medical examiners who left the FDA ended up working for companies they previously were responsible for regulating. That's uh, roughly two-thirds or more than two-thirds. These wealthy and powerful pharmaceutical companies recruit former FDA employees with lucrative job offers in order to leverage their connections. Uh, existing law imposes only a very limited restrictions on this revolving door. Former employees are only prohibited from lobbying the FDA for very few specific matters, and they're only subject to a two-year cooling off period. Um, meanwhile, you know, former FDA employees can go and collect, you know, pretty substantial paychecks from companies once regulated. Just two months after leaving the government service, the lead medical officer for the FDA's Office of Vaccine Research and Review took a high-level job at Moderna. There was another one recently, the medical officer who decided on behalf of the FDA whether the clinical data for Moderna's vaccine medicine met approval standards, also took a job shortly after that with the company just months after the, the, after the, the vaccine received license. And so I think you can see why many Americans can look at a history of this and be very, very concerned about what's going on, especially, you know, coming out of COVID, FDA, along with a number of agencies, I think we can all look back and say there were a lot of lessons learned. It wasn't handled really in the best. Uh, and so right now we're trying to restore the American populace's uh, faith in a lot of these institutions that, that you're now leading and have, have just taken up the mantle recently with again. Um, can you speak to that uh, issue, uh, you know, with regard to these two FDA officials specifically, um, did either of these recu recuse themselves from any matter at the FDA while seeking these jobs that you're aware of? Well, that is, I mean, the, this last point you made is a very important um, part of the system, regardless of how you feel about the other parts of um, 
people moving from FDA to industry or industry into FDA, you're prohibited from seeking a job in the area that you're regulating unless you recuse yourself. So um, that is something that... Um, the, the FDA has refused to acknowledge on these two individuals, Dr. Dorian Fink and Dr. Jaya Goswami, I, I believe is the pronunciation, uh, whether or not these two recuse themselves of their involvement in these areas that they were leading before going to, to Moderna. Uh, so why has the FDA refused to provide the information? Uh, I'm uh, unaware of what you're describing. I'll cert we'll certainly uh, go back and um, look into that. Again, um, if they were not seeking employment while they were regulating, then they didn't violate um, do, anything. Do but we know that they, so so they sought guidance on approval of the FDA? Uh, I'm I, sorry, the FDA's ethics office before taking those jobs? I would expect that they um, would have, but I don't know that, you know, we'll have to go back. Um, can you understand the concern and what recommendations would you provide, you know, from I think it was 1981 to 2019, uh, nine of the ten commissioners uh, went into work for pharmaceutical companies short, uh, from leaving their office. You, you were one of those as well. I'm not suggesting any impropriety at this point. Uh, but you can certainly see, I think, how this would create a, a huge concern, a conflict of interest when the American people are looking at this. What recommendations would you suggest that we bring up to, to make sure that the American people can know that the decision's being made? Because here's the thing, it's, it, you're supposed to give oversight to these companies, whether you know, you're in the food and drug industry, and and you know that you're not going to get a job, not you specific, I'm speaking, you know, someone who wants one of these high paying jobs after leaving the department knows that, you know, they're not going to be hired by someone who was very strict uh, on them. And, and so it, there's a built in incentive, of course, to be lax in these things. And so what can we do in Congress to provide a, a level playing field that will help well, restore the public's trust in this area. Glad to engage in a discussion with you on that, but I do want to point out something about this. We're dealing with highly, uh, inside the FDA, we're dealing with highly technical issues that require a lot of expertise. There are many people who work in industry and then volunteer to come to FDA for a much lower salary because they're attracted to the issue of understanding the science and making good decisions based on it. By the same token, there are people who work within the FDA for a period of time. They have skills and knowledge about an area. And, uh, you know, it's an issue to say, well, they could never work in an industry where they might develop a cure for cancer or whatever the, um, the thing may be. So this is a delicate area. It needs to be looked at. You're perfectly right to raise the I, issue. I, I'm, I'm not saying that there's no legitimate reason. This is why I'm asking yeah. for your recommendations as someone who's actually running you know, yeah. the agency right now. What protections could we put? What recommendations would you provide that would not be onerous, but you know, nine out of 10 going straight to the pharmaceutical company, straight out of office is you know, pretty circumspect when the American people are looking at that. So uh, what would you recommend for us as Congress to, to, that would be reasonable provisions that would uh, allow us to, to bring the full faith of this, these agencies back to the United States. He, his time's expired, but answer the, please answer the question. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, it's, it's a complicated area. I would say, number one, is just making sure we adhere to what we already said. You've raised some questions about this. There are... Uh, uh, exceptions are given all the time to yeah. these, is my understanding. You know, so there's rules, I, but hey, we waive them all the time because it's, I, it's a self-check kind of I thing. don't think that's true at all. I would speak very highly of our ethics office. I was 2016, the first time around, I spent a lot of time bringing in uh, new people, and I don't think exceptions are given all the time okay. to these. But uh, we can always do better, and I'm happy to engage on it. So no recommendations so far? Well, it's a very broad area, so I'm reluctant to just off the cuff make a specific recommendation. Okay. Well, look forward to working with you. Okay. Hey, uh, they've called votes, but we're going to try to get go to Mr. Conley and then uh, Mr. Donald, and then we'll have be these just two votes won't take long. We'll be right back. We'll recess. Chairman, I think Mr. Moskowitz is ahead of me. We'll go to Moskowitz then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. Chairman. It's, it won't be the usual. Uh, and I'll try to get you some time back. Well, first of all, thank you for coming today, Commissioner. I think you've established that if any of my colleagues get ivermectin, I mean, get worms, you'll make sure that they get ivermectin. 
So we don't, we don't have to like rehash all of that nonsense. I want to turn your attention though to a little bit of the aftermath of COVID uh, in the pharmaceutical space. I mean, do you think it's appropriate that with all the supply chain issues that America had during COVID that we've not really fixed in a broader sense, but in the medical sense, in the pharmaceutical space, I mean, should we still be getting a majority of our owner counter drugs from Wuhan? Should they still be produced there? Should we still be depending upon Wuhan, China to be making drugs that we sell in a significant basis on shelves in this country? Well, I mean, I'd say, I'm not sure it's specifically Wuhan, but the key starting materials for drugs are mostly coming from China, and I don't think that's good for us. We don't need to have no drugs from China, but we need to have a firm manufacturing base that we can be confident about in these times of stress. Dur during the two bills, and I know you weren't necessarily there, but during the two bills, one in the Trump administration, one in the Biden administration, where we spent seven or eight trillion dollars combined after COVID, how come the FDA wasn't advocating, or if they were, I'd love to hear it, why weren't they advocating to start establishing, with all that government money was spent, why weren't we establishing that we should start manufacturing those products here? I wasn't there at the time. I would just say, um, you know, pretty much the time I came in in February 2022, we really saw how stark the problem was, and we started advocating then. But, you know, we live in a country uh, where the pharmaceutical industry is for profit. If people are not getting the prices they want, or the purchaser is getting a lower price overseas, that's where they go. So. To fix this is going to take some kind of intervention, which is well beyond the FDA. We're certainly advocating that intervention is needed. All right, let me turn your attention. I know you got a bunch of questions on, on cancer drugs. My dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He lived 18 months, and he passed away about a month before I ran for office. He was on cisplatin. At that time, there were no issues. Do you, do you think it's acceptable in America um, that families would get told by there are doctors that we're gonna to have to push off a treatment because there is a shortage of a chemotherapy that is helping keep extending the lives, keeping people alive. Do you think that's acceptable in this country? And, and why is it that we're not, we're not more better, we're not better prepared to handle when we, there's these manufacturing issues, whether it's in India or China, why are we not better prepared to handle these things? I. I won't say, uh, here's what I'd say. First of all, it's unacceptable. I mean, I have a close relative with pancreatic cancer right now. I know how frightening it is. Um, I would just say, you know, what's happened is we have health systems, hospitals, pharmacies, and we have manufacturers who are mostly overseas now. If we take cisplatin as an example, five years ago it was $400 a dose. It's a generic drug. I gave it as an intern in 1978. Now it was $13 a dose. You cannot make cisplatin for $13 a dose and, and maintain quality. So people running the company say, why should I make it? And we don't have a system in place that says, this is an essential drug. We're going to put something into effect which uh, causes the market to behave. Well, I don't want to interrupt. I mean, you are the FDA, you know, perhaps you know, that's something you guys should be looking at. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to be working with manufacturers all day long on trying to incentivize them to make life-saving drugs that may not be. Well, I mean, if I may, we have no authority to give incentives. We, we, have, we are prohibited by law from dealing with pricing. But I would refer you to the HHS report that came out last week with our heavy input that goes through all the details here. So I'm completely in tune with your concern. And uh, I think people around the administration know every time I'm on a call, I'll bring it up. There, there's been reports in some of the vaping products in Florida uh, seeing fentanyl in them. You know, what are we doing about some of these things coming in from China, some of the illegal vaping products? This is, uh, I'm very concerned about what you raised. And we just had a meeting, uh, an annual meeting in Atlanta where mostly of parents of children who have died from overdose Ann Milgram, the DEA administrator, was there and gave the details about how these products are getting into the mainstream of America through cartels predominantly. This is really a combined effort. FDA has a role, but it's now become mostly a law enforcement um, issue with DEA, and we are working together 
as closely as we can. But I'm not pretending that we have this problem solved at this point. It is a big deal. Thanks, Commissioner. Chair, Chair now recognize Mr. Donalds from Florida. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thanks for being here. Uh, listen, I support the FDA's efforts to reduce uh, youth smoking rates under their current authority granted by Congress. However, I do not support the unnecessary and unfounded regulations like the FDA's proposed tobacco product standard for characterizing flavors in cigars rule, which is purely based um, on, frankly, in my view, more, for far more politics than science. Uh, what are some of the examples of the unintended consequences that might arise out of this rule? Langworthy, Luna. Well, first, the intended consequences would be a reduction in death rates, which is a pretty important one in my view. Um, in terms of unintended consequences, uh, there is always going to be some illicit market when um, rules like this are put into effect. So then do you think it's wise for, wise for the FDA to proceed? I think it's very wise to reduce the death rates in um, but you also, populations. But, concern. Commissioner, you did also acknowledge, and we're seeing it, frankly, in a lot of uh, markets associated with, with, with smoking, but right now we're focused on flavored cigars. So it is, your contention is that it is okay to put in this rule around flavors in premium cigars because you have adults who are choosing to smoke flavored premium cigars. Now, if you want to talk about flavored cigars, I would just say uh, youth right now are smoking cigars more than they're smoking cigarettes. Flavored cigars are highly attractive to youth, and so it's a major concern that we have. Premium cigars is a different issue. That's in the courts right now, so I can't comment on it. All right, so secondarily, California enacted a flavor ban on all tobacco products at the end of 2022. California already suffers from the second highest rate of cigarette smuggling where nearly 50% of all cigarettes used by consumers are purchased out of state. Further, in 2020, one in six cigarette packs in California were smuggled into the state from international markets. In which, way does, in which ways does an illicit tobacco market impact the United States of America? You know, I just was out in California about four months ago, and I met with the public health department there. Their, their longevity is so much higher than the average of the United States largely due to the reduction in things like the use of tobacco. They have very low rates of use of tobacco but compared to the rest of the U.S. So are we, are I we think gonna, overall it's a net positive. But, Commissioner, are we going to acknowledge the fact that, yes, there are black markets propping up in, in whether it's illicit cigarettes or if we were to go back to the previous topic of premium cigars, in part because of the policies of the United States? Do we acknowledge that? You know, as I've already discussed, I'm a cardiologist. I'm used to life and death. Almost everyone prefers to be alive. I would rather reduce total mortality and deal with the illicit market than to tolerate 460,000 Americans dying of tobacco-related illness per year, but Commissioner, which is what our current rate is, and that's a lower from what it used to be. But, Commissioner, I'm we also... I'm taking care of these Commissioner, people. When we you also, see people Commissioner, dying, Commissioner, it's not good. We also have to acknowledge the fact that you're not omnipotent. You can't control the actions of people. Do you truly believe that you have the ability to control the actions of Americans if they choose adults now? Now, move away from children for a moment. Adults, if they choose to smoke a cigar or if they choose to smoke a cigarette. And by the way, I don't agree with smoking cigarettes not a cigarette smoker, but at the same time, do we acknowledge the reality that when you put up these barriers, what you also do is create an illicit market for these products, which could be more harmful to the users that, that, take, that I, use them? I would never pretend to be able to control the behavior of people, but imagine if we had taken that attitude. When I started out as a cardiologist, the average patient I took care of was 50 years old, typically a man smoking cigarettes, dying at a rate of 30 out, 30 out of every 100 people with a heart attack in the first 30 days. Now the typical patient with heart disease is in the 70s because the rates of use of tobacco drop so much, not because someone has you know, over think that's, Do you think that's because of informing the public or do you think that's because of government regulation? I think it's a combination of both of those. Commissioner, I would argue it is far better to get people to change behavior by informing them of the consequences of said behavior as opposed to putting up arbitrary rules from the FDA or anywhere else. I, I like that in general, but this is a highly... It's addictive. not in general, Commissioner. That is a reality of, hu of the human condition. When you're dealing with people suffering from addiction, nicotine is a terrible addiction, very difficult to beat. 
Commissioner, we weren't, we, we're not, we hadn't got to a conversation about addiction. We're just talking about FDA rules around, frankly, flavored, flavored cigars and also some of the California rules Nic around cigarette bans. Nicotine is a highly addictive substance, so we are talking I'm well about aware. Addiction. I'm well aware that it is, Commissioner, but again, I would argue that information and education is far better than regulation and elimination. I yield. Gentlemen's time's expired. Pursuant to the previous order, the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. The committee will reconvene 10 minutes after the floor votes. Stand in recess.
the committee will come back to order. Chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for your patience, Commissioner Califf. Um, I want to talk about kind of your current policies in terms of hybrid telework. Uh, we have here, just for, uh, for the American people watching from your website, that says the White, Coat, White Oak campus, your main campus is open, but yet is open with maximum telework flexibilities. Um, and Mr. Commissioner, I sent you a letter back in January. Um, I haven't received a response yet. So I'll just ask you these questions today. Um, and it's essentially, can you just talk about your telework policy and why we're still teleworking and when you plan to bring everybody back in in person? Well, thanks for the question. And I think to answer this question, it's useful to start from before the pandemic because mm -hmm. when I was commissioner in 2016, we had a four out of five days on campus um, policy because we didn't have enough offices for the number of people that we had. So it was actually a requirement and we had our um, Zoom capabilities and all that built up well before the pandemic. But, you know, when I arrived in 2022, the pandemic was well underway and we had instituted um, a policy of measurement. Uh, the primary accountability of the American public is getting the work done. Um, we're meeting all of our metrics and our user fees um, quite well. I think you can, uh, that's a matter of public record. Um, and when you look at the output of the employees, it's quite high. And now, within that, we have a number of people who uh, work in laboratories. They've always um, gone to the facility to work because that's where the laboratory is. Mm -hmm. We actually have 270 facilities all around the U.S. because we have a large um, inspectorate and other activities and labs that are located all around the U.S. Those people are... Um, obviously going to work every day in person. Just in the, in the interest of time, Mr. Chris, from my understanding, and I'm hearing consistently from industry, number one, the FDA, FDA granted in-person meetings without a hybrid component prior to COVID. So have we gone to more hybrid because of COVID? And are you back to pre-pandemic well, levels of in-person? Because what the, the concern is, and the concern in my letter, and I would appreciate it, yeah an answer to some of the questions in it, is that life-saving drugs, I'm getting this from chief medical officers, I'm getting this from uh, providers and others, can't get the same type of due diligence. You can't have the same type of meeting. And in fact, I've talked to a number of uh, companies that said their meetings have been delayed because they didn't have the right type of Zoom capabilities when you could just come in and, and have the meeting. So it's actually delaying the approval process I'd be, well, first of all, I know that- These are like, people are dying. I, Let's, well, the pandemic's over. The administration declared it over last year. The, the approval process is definitely not being delayed because those metrics are kept and we've had a record number of approvals and our timelines have been met. Um, we offer the option of in-person or hybrid meetings now. Many times the industry chooses hybrid because to have an in-person meeting, they got to fly everybody to White Oak to be there and it's more convenient and more they get a better attendance themselves. I'm hearing from industry that they would prefer in person and then those are delayed because uh, of um, uh, because of investments. We need more investments in Zoom, more investments in those kind of meetings, more investments in your infrastructure. That may be true of some of the industry, but it's definitely not true of all of the industry. And we, I, I would expect that in the future there'll be much more in person from both sides wanting it, FDA and the industry. But I'd be shocked if we did it totally away with hybrid because often that's what the industry wants. Why in the future would there be more in person? Um, because people like to be in person when they can. So why aren't we there now? Because often people really find it more convenient to not have to fly everybody to White Oak. So there's a transition, you know, period going on. And can you describe the, what's the transition issue? Well, um, you know, there are a limited number of meeting rooms that are completely up to speed. That's, you know, coming up to into speed place. for 
for the hybrid meetings that we often have to have because often industry has people on both sides of that equation, people who want to be there in person and others who want to So it's, you're saying it's industry really driving the demand for hybrid I, that you're making the, that's, the that, investments? No, um, I wouldn't want to say that. I'd say often it's both sides. The industry, you know, would like to have either option is what I would say. I think if the, from what I'm hearing, consistently, and I would, I would implore you to, to take a deeper look into this. The industry just wants the meetings however they have to happen. And they certainly don't want them delayed because of a lack of rooms that have been upgraded for hybrid, especially when they're things for things like ALS where people are literally dying month to month with these delays. I, I mean, I think you're, uh, I'm not arguing with your basic points other than to say, from everything I can see, we're meeting our timelines and we've got a record number of approvals that have occurred. So by any metric you would use, the place is pretty darn efficient right now. Uh, just, just in the time I have remaining, uh, I think we have a, <laughs> maybe we need to relook at the metrics. I, I, I don't know, but I'm just telling you what we're consistently hearing uh, and if they were being approved and it were you were having in-person meetings and they weren't well, being delayed being evaluated so let's let's be clear about that our job is to evaluate not just to approve i mean we approve it when the data supports approval but you can't but, get to really have those conversations about the data if you're delaying because of meeting rooms again i'd be right. surprised if there are delays occurring because of meeting rooms okay thank you mr chairman if you could please take a uh, ask your team sure. to look at the letter this i'm on four committees and i've never had uh, to wait four months for a response just to say basic questions All thank right. you appreciate that thank you mr chairman chair now recognize mr langworthy from new york Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Califf, uh, my constituents, many of whom don't have the same access to a doctor's office as my colleagues in urban or sprawling suburban areas often do, they're the ones most impacted by the FDA's inaction uh, and lack of clarity on prescription to over-the-counter, or in other words, RX to OTC switch. Um, what, what this can often result in is a lack of expanded over-the-counter access for medicines that have already gone through an approval process uh, at the FDA and deserve serious and timely consideration so that constituents, our taxpayers, can have more easy access to the care and to the help that they need. Uh, Commissioner Calf, can you explain why we only see a small percentage of the prescription to over-the-counter switch annually, and what can we do to increase that number? Sure, appreciate um, that, and also appreciate the importance to rural people, especially of um, having access to medications. I mean, um, what the regulations require is that the company that wants to make that switch has to produce the evidence that if they go to over the counter, that the person purchasing um, the product can understand the instructions and use it appropriately, and therefore doesn't need an in intermediary to do the prescribing and the interaction. Uh, with a person as a patient. So I would say whenever um, a manufacturer produces that evidence, you know, we're anxious to get it and uh, to take action uh, if they've got the data to support what they want to do. So it's really a matter, they, they actually can't just make the switch because they have to show that a consumer can actually understand the instructions and apply the medication appropriately. Uh, unfortunately, what we're hearing, Dr. Calif, is that for, for too long the switch process has been muddled by, you know, moving goalposts, uh, challenges engaging in a, in a dialogue uh, with the FDA and a, a culture at the FDA that seems to reward denying reviews and approvals rather than trying to get things done. Uh, but I have limited time, so I'd like to move on. Um, essentially, pharmaceutical companies are disclosing their uh, inventions to the FDA years before disclosing them to the patent office, uh, which can elongate commercial monopolies inappropriately by 10 years. Uh, due to inconsistent filing with both the FDA and the patent and trademark office by branded companies, many of the most uh, expensive drugs on the market are artificially blocked from generic competition. Now, this leads to billions of dollars in lost savings to patients, 
uh, and to taxpayers. Uh, President Biden released a pharmaceutical competition executive order that encouraged the FDA and the Patent Trade Office uh, to collaborate on this issue, and FDA uh, has also conducted listening sessions where the issue uh, was apparently discussed extensively. Uh, however, there seems to be no recent progress on this front. Uh, so what real solutions is FDA, in fact, considering to address this problem, and when can we expect to receive an update? Well, we'd be happy to give your staff an update any day. I, I disagree with the view there's no progress being made. There's a very active collaboration with the Patent Office um, in an effort to reduce the number of um, inappropriate patents that get in there and block the generic um, competition. So we can give you an update on what's happened with that. Uh, we had a long discussion about this earlier this afternoon, but let me just say that um, the Patent Office has the primary responsibility for determining if there's something unique that merits a patent. That's not an FDA call. You're correct that we see the pipeline of what's coming from pharma. That's commercial confidential information that by law we can't, relate, we can't um, release to anyone else. But what we want to do is make sure that there's good communication so the Patent Office understands when it's actually a valid new patent that would extend that uh, protection from competition. Okay, thanks. In, in my remaining time, I really want to switch gears here. Um, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, numerous studies have linked a range of health issues with the consumption of plant-based beverages by children. Um, furthermore, there is considerable confusion uh, and misinformation about the substitution of non-dairy products for cow's milk. Uh, the FDA itself determined that based on 13,000 public comments, quote, consumers do not understand the nutritional differences between milk and plant-based milk alternatives. Uh, so, Commissioner, can you comment on the FDA's efforts to enforce dairy product standards of identity, uh, particularly the use of the term milk and the actions your agency is taking to mitigate the risks posed by the chronic mislabeling of non-dairy products using established dairy terms? Well, I'm, I'm glad you referred to the nutritional content because that is the primary deficit here, and we are um, requiring that that nutritional information be prominently displayed as um, part, of, part of the effort. What we're not doing is specifying exactly what can be called milk because this is, how do I say it, the cow's out of the barn already. It's been um, decades that that terminology has been used, and Whenever those kinds of issues, when we make a rule to require it be called something when it's been different, we've lost those cases in court. But what I think is really important is when people purchase something, they actually understand the nutritional content, and that is heavily emphasized in what we're currently um, putting forth. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you answering my questions. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now to recognize myself for, for five minutes. I've had uh, a lot of members yield me time, but now we're going to uh, ask my questions. Commissioner, in this hearing, you have said that the term harm reduction is an industry term or a term that industry uses. But to be clear, the Institute of Medicine used this term in the title of its report titled Clearing the Smoke, Assessing the Science Base for Tobacco Harm Reduction. So it's not just industry that uses this term. The Institute of Medicine uses it. And the concept of harm reduction has been embraced in other countries. That is, they accept and communicate that there are options that are less risky than a traditional cigarette. Are we ever going to get to that point in this country? Do you accept so, this idea? I definitely accept the idea. Your point is well taken that industry is not the only um, entity to use it, but what I want to avoid, speaking of harm reduction, we've talked about combustible tobacco kills people. Neither using vaping or combustible tobacco is the healthiest thing you can do. Vaping compared to none of the above has residues that are quite concerning for long-term use. So if you're a combustible tobacco user, if you switch to vaping, that's less harm. That's good. As long as the product is not packaged in a way that's encouraging youth to get addicted to nicotine. One of the main harms I want to get away from is millions of youth being addicted to nicotine by vaping products. So we've got to find that middle ground. And, and I accept there's a point here 
I'm just worried that when we use the term harm reduction now, it's often part of a vast advertising campaign that's not taking account but, of the addiction side in youth. But you admit that vaping is, is less harmful than, than cigarettes. I mean, we, we Right. Admitting we, it we all, sounds right. like I'm confessing of something. No, I agree. Right, right, I agree. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about all the applications that have been submitted, millions of applications. I think you, you've approved 25 or something. This Almost 27 million. Have been, have been applied. Right. Uh, have requested application, but you haven't approved, but just a handful. Uh, so is the reason for the, the backlogs, are, are, is that going to, are you working on it? Are you trying to approve more? Or are you just throwing the towel in and say, we're just not going to have anything or, or. No, no, we're, we're working every day. And so you think there'll be more I mean, approval? As commissioner, I meet with the Center for Tobacco Products Leadership every week and we well, you, um, I mean, go over this. I, but again, we can only approve a product by law if the company produces the data that demonstrates that they meet the public health standard, that is that the reduction in risk that we just talked about to but adults the, who use combustible the, tobacco and, offsets the addiction right. and, and you, risk. You've heard a lot of people ask this question the, in, on both sides of the aisle, and we don't agree on a whole lot in this committee in, in a bipartisan manner, but the FDA's refusal to approve these new tobacco products has created a thriving market for illegal and unsafe products, primarily from China. Uh, these products receive warning letters from FDA, but I don't think China loses a whole lot of sleep over a warning letter from a U.S. governmental agency, especially in the Biden administration. So a lot of people have questions as to why there's so many of these Chinese products, counterfeit products on the, on the market. They ask us. That's why so many different members have asked you about it. I mean, What's the reason? What are we supposed to say? Why we say it's FDA's responsibility? So why is the FDA enabling these these I, Chinese products? I believe yeah, there's I, a solution I would, here. I wouldn't use the term enabling, but I would say that this is a huge production issue coming out of China into our ports. We need to um, stop the use of illegal products. Um, well, the, the, this administration has proven it's it's unable to do anything uh, at the border with respect to security, but wouldn't a foreign ma manufacturer rule address this problem? Uh, a rule that that pertains to foreign manufacturers from the FDA for this. Um, I mean, as 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 we said uh, many times today, we're the referees. You make the rules. So um, if you choose to do that. Um, you may. I would also say a lot of pro a lot of profits being made in the vaping industry. If they paid their u if they had user fees, we would put a Are lot. Are these more Chinese money. companies paying the user fees? Whoever sold the product would have to pay the user fee. Um, last question with respect to CBD. What's the what do you foresee over the next twelve months from? FDA with respect to CBD. Do you see any action or, or you know, you, you mentioned you're close, you're communicating on the uh, Center for Tobacco, but what about the uh, shifting gears here with, with CBD oil, industrial hemp and things like that? Is the FDA close to making any decision on anything? I think it's Congress's decision to make. So we would really look forward to working you with you all as quickly as possible to come up with a regulatory pathway that you think is reasonable and enables us to take action. Well, my time has expired, and I'm going to yield to the ranking member. This concludes the questioning phase, unless Mr. Conley's on his way back or anything. I don't think. Okay. Well, uh, we appreciate you being here, and I'm going to let yield to ranking member Raskin if he has any closing remarks. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner Caleb. I just want to thank you for your um, your great devotion to the task here and. Um, you're a model public servant in trying to advance the public interest at every turn. Um, the, uh, the scope of the issues that you have to address on a daily basis is staggering. Um, and um, the challenges faced by the FDA are um, mammoth. Um, and we should not be adding to your burdens by uh, beating you up for 
pet ideological causes. Um, and I was disappointed that some of our colleagues went in that direction today. Um, I just wanted to clear up a couple little things. One is the Inflation Reduction Act is not responsible for drug shortages. Um, and contrary to Republican claims, it's already substantially lowered costs for life-saving medications, even as it's projected to reduce the deficit by $237 billion. And you ask how we pulled off the feet of uh, reducing to $35 a month what people have to pay for insulin shots if they're diabetic, while at the same time saving hundreds of billions of dollars for the taxpayers. It's simple. Um, we took a strong stand that the federal government should be able to negotiate with Big Pharma for lower drug prices, and so we've saved hundreds of billions of dollars at the same time that we've dramatically reduced the cost of prescription drugs, despite um, the unfortunate and categorical partisan objection of our uh, Republican colleagues. Um, so the shortages we're seeing today um, are primarily in generic uh, medications, um, and Republican opponents of the Inflation Reduction Act claim it's already stifled the production of brand name drugs, which is just false. Uh, HHS recently published a white paper with multiple recommendations for what needs to be done to address drug shortages, none of which involve repealing the Inflation Reduction Act. Rather, they focus on ways in which the private sector can work with the FDA to shore up drug supply chains. And the Commissioner has laid out a number of other ideas here today, and we would do well to defer to his expertise and to take it to heart. We'd also be remiss not to clarify that ivermectin is not effective against COVID-19. Um, and there's no reason to think anything wrong of people who wanted to check it out for those purposes, as the good commissioner testified today, but it didn't work. Um, the Fifth Circuit never said otherwise, and it is not the role of the Fifth Circuit to determine whether a drug is safe and effective, be it um, ivermectin or mifepristone. That's the FDA's job, and it's a job that relies on the quality and the integrity of the science and the research. Um, some of our colleagues chose to blame the FDA exclusively for infant formula shortages um, when they could have joined us on our side of the aisle in our investigation into Abbott Nutrition and its role that it played. Democrats never received all the documents we were promised by Abbott, and uh, our friends across the aisle could choose to help with that and provide the American people the accountability and the transparency we all deserve. Um, Across the aisle, we share concerns about the illegal vapes coming into the country from China. Um, I hope our colleagues will join the Democrats in supporting a whole-of-government approach to counter smuggling of illicit substances and products, including adequately funding federal law enforcement agencies. We should be concerned not just about illegal substances coming in from China, but from any country and every country of concern. So. Um, we thank you for your, uh, your patience and your seriousness today. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for calling uh, the hearing, which I think has been very productive, and I yield back to you. Uh, the gentleman yields back, and I'll conclude by, again, Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Uh, I think this was a very substantive hearing. Uh, we covered topics from uh, seafood inspection uh, all the way to just about every other topic that I think w could be uh, imaginable uh, throughout the, the past five and a half hours. Now, I do want to correct, I always have to correct my, my uh, colleague across the aisle. The Inflation Reduction Act was the title, but I think it'll be known throughout history as the Inflation Creation Act, and that's why uh, I don't believe a single Republican voted for it. And with respect to transparency, uh, that Mr. Raskin said that we deserve, I agree, we deserve transparency. Hopefully in our investigations, the administration will turn over uh, the uh, email, the pseudonym emails and uh, the, the tape, the her tapes and all the other uh, items of relevance to our uh, other investigation that we have ongoing. With respect to... Uh, but is that one still ongoing? I wasn't sure. Yes, it oh, it is. Yeah, okay. I know. You, well, see, you, 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 <laughs> need, you need to stop watching CNN. You need to go to Main Street and ask people. People, But uh, at the end of the day, the, we appreciate your attendance. We've requested a lot of information, and hopefully we'll follow up each individual member that asks questions. Uh, as I travel America and travel Kentucky, we have a lot of people in the private sector that, that are concerned with the pace at which FDA moves to 
uh, approved medical device. You know, th th there's uh, a lot of concern, as, as I've stated to you in the last two days, with respect to the uncertainty around the tobacco products, the lack of uh, enforcement of the uh, Chinese illegal uh, vape products that are the ones that are creating so much havoc uh, with, our, with our young people and, and uh, across America, and so much uncertainty in the CBD industry as well. So we look forward to working with you on that. Uh, with that and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there's no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.